History of Africa, Wikipedia article audio. The history of Africa begins with the emergence of hominids, archaic humans and, around 5.6 to 7.5 million years ago, anatomically modern humans, in East Africa, and continues unbroken into the present as a patchwork of diverse and politically developing nation-states. The earliest known recorded history arose in the Kingdom of Kush, and later in ancient Egypt, the Sahel, the Maghrib, and the Horn of Africa. Following the desertification of the Sahara, North African history became entwined with the Middle East and Southern Europe while the Bantu expansion swept from modern-day Cameroon across much of the sub-Saharan continent in waves between around 1000 BCE and 0 CE, creating a linguistic commonality across much of the Central and Southern continent. During the Middle Ages, Islam spread west from Arabia to Egypt, crossing the Maghreb and the Sahel. Some notable pre-colonial states and societies in Africa include the Ajuran Empire, DMT, Adal Sultanate, War Sangali Sultanate, Kingdom of NRI, Nok Culture, Mali Empire, Songhai Empire, Benin Empire, Oyo Empire, Ashanti Empire, Ghana Empire, Masi Kingdoms, Mutapa Empire, Kingdom of Mapungabwe. Kingdom of Sin, Kingdom of Sener, Kingdom of Saloum, Kingdom of Baal, Kingdom of Kair, Kingdom of Zimbabwe, Kingdom of Congo, Empire of Kaabu, Kingdom of Isle Ife, Ancient Carthage, Numidia, Mauritania, and the Aksumite Empire. At its peak, prior to European colonialism, it is estimated that Africa had up to 10,000 different states and autonomous groups with distinct languages and customs. Prehistory Paleolithic From the mid-7th century, the Arab slave trade saw Muslim Arabs and slave Africans following an armistice between the Rashidun Caliphate and the Kingdom of Makuria after the Second Battle of Dongola in 652 AD. They were transported, along with Asians and Europeans, across the Red Sea, Indian Ocean, and Sahara Desert. From the late 15th century, Europeans joined the slave trade that includes the triangular trade, with the Portuguese initially acquiring slaves through trade and later by force as part of the Atlantic slave trade. They transported enslaved West, Central, and Southern Africans overseas. Subsequently, European colonization of Africa developed rapidly from around 10% to over 90% in the scramble for Africa. However following struggles for independence in many parts of the continent, as well as a weakened Europe after the Second World War, decolonization took place across the continent, culminating in the 1960 year of Africa. Africa's pre-colonial history has been challenging to research within the field of African studies, because of the scarcity of written sources in large parts of the continent particularly with the destruction of many of the most important manuscripts from Timbuktu. Disciplines such as the recording of oral history, historical linguistics, archaeology, and genetics have been crucial. The first known hominids evolved in Africa. According to paleontology, the early hominids' skull anatomy was similar to that of the gorilla and the chimpanzee, great apes that also evolved in Africa, but the hominids had adopted a bipedal locomotion which freed their hands. This gave them a crucial advantage, enabling them to live in both forested areas and on the open savanna at a time when Africa was drying up and the savanna was encroaching on forested areas. This occurred 10 to 5 million years ago. By 4 million years ago, Several Australopithecine hominid species had developed throughout southern, eastern, and central Africa. They were tool users, and makers of tools. 
they scavenged for meat and were omnivores. By approximately 3.3 million years ago, primitive stone tools were first used to scavenge kills made by other predators and to harvest carrion and marrow from their bones. In hunting, Homo habilis was probably not capable of competing with large predators and was still more prey than hunter. H. habilis probably did steal eggs from nests and may have been able to catch small game and weakened larger prey. The tools were classed as Old Owen. Emergence of Agriculture Around 1.8 million years ago, Homo ergaster first appeared in the fossil record in Africa. From Homo ergaster, Homo erectus evolved 1.5 million years ago. Some of the earlier representatives of this species were still fairly small-brained and used primitive stone tools, much like H. habilis. The brain later grew in size, and H. erectus eventually developed a more complex stone tool technology called the Acheulean. Possibly the first hunters, H. erectus mastered the art of making fire and was the first hominid to leave Africa, colonizing most of Afro-Eurasia and perhaps later giving rise to Homo floresiensis. Although some recent writers suggest that Homo georgicus was the first and most primitive hominid ever to live outside Africa, many scientists consider H. georgicus to be an early and primitive member of the H. erectus species. The fossil record shows Homo sapiens living in southern and eastern Africa at least 200,000 to 150,000 years ago. Around 40,000 years ago, the species' expansion out of Africa launched the colonization of the planet by modern human beings. By 10,000 BC, Homo sapiens had spread to most corners of Afro-Eurasia. Their DISP arils are traced by linguistic, cultural, and genetic evidence. The earliest physical evidence of astronomical activity appears to be a lunar calendar found on the Ishango bone dated to between 23,000 and 18,000 BC. Central Africa Scholars have argued that warfare was absent throughout much of humans' prehistoric past, and that it emerged after sedentism, farming, and more complex political systems arose. However, the findings at the site of Nadaruk in Turkana County, Kenya, where the remains of 27 individuals who died as the result of an intentional attack by another group 10,000 years ago, show that intergroup conflict has a much longer history. Around 16,000 BC, from the Red Sea hills to the northern Ethiopian highlands, nuts, grasses, and tubers were being collected for food. By 13,000 to 11,000 BC, people began collecting wild grains. This spread to Western Asia, which domesticated its wild grains, wheat, and barley. Between 10,000 and 8,000 BC, Northeast Africa was cultivating wheat and barley and raising sheep and cattle from Southwest Asia. A wet climatic phase in Africa turned the Ethiopian highlands into a mountain forest. Omotic speakers domesticated Nset around 6500-5500 BC. Around 7000 BC, the settlers of the Ethiopian highlands domesticated donkeys, and by 4000 BC domesticated donkeys had spread to Southwest Asia. Cushitic speakers partially turning away from cattle herding, domesticated teff and finger millet between 5,500 and 3,500 BC. In the steppes and savannas of the Sahara and Sahel in northern West Africa, the Nilo-Saharan speakers and Monde peoples started to collect and domesticate wild millet, African rice, and sorghum between 8,000 and 6,000 BC. Later, Gourds, watermelons, castor beans, and cotton were also collected and domesticated. The people started capturing wild cattle and holding them in circular thorn hedges, 
resulting in domestication. They also started making pottery and built stone settlements. Fishing, using bone-tipped harpoons, became a major activity in the numerous streams and lakes formed from the increased rains. Metallurgy In West Africa, the wet phase ushered in an expanding rainforest and wooded savanna from Senegal to Cameroon. Between 9000 and 5000 BC, Niger Congo speakers domesticated the oil palm and raffia palm. Two seed plants, black eyed peas and vonzaya, were domesticated, followed by okra and kola nuts. Since most of the plants grew in the forest, the Niger Congo speakers invented polished stone axes for clearing forest. Antiquity most of southern Africa was occupied by Pygmy peoples and Khoisan who engaged in hunting and gathering. Some of the oldest rock art was produced by them. Ancient Egypt Just prior to Saharan desertification, the communities that developed south of Egypt, in what is now Sudan, were full participants in the Neolithic Revolution and lived a settled to semi-nomadic lifestyle with domesticated plants and animals. It has been suggested that megaliths found at Nabta Playa are examples of the world's first known archaeoastronomical devices, predating Stonehenge by some 1,000 years. The socio-cultural complexity observed at Nabta Playa and expressed by different levels of authority within the society there has been suggested as forming the basis for the structure of both the Neolithic society at Nabta and the Old Kingdom of Egypt. By 5000 BC, Africa entered a dry phase, and the climate of the Sahara region gradually became drier. The population trekked out of the Sahara region in all directions, including towards the Nile Valley below the Second Cataract, where they made permanent or semi-permanent settlements. A major climatic recession occurred, lessening the heavy and persistent rains in Central and Eastern Africa. Since then, dry conditions have prevailed in Eastern Africa. Archaeological finds in Central Africa have been discovered dating back to over 100,000 years. Extensive walled sites and settlements have recently been found in Zilam, Chad approximately 60 km southwest of Lake Chad dating to the first millennium BC. Nubia Trade and improved agricultural techniques supported more sophisticated societies leading to the early civilizations of Sao, Kanem, Bornu, Shiluk, Bagirmai, and Wada. Around 1000 BC, Bantu migrants had reached the Great Lakes region in Central Africa. Halfway through the first millennium BC, the Bantu had also settled as far south as what is now Angola. The first metals to be smelted in Africa were lead, copper, and bronze in the 4th millennium BC. Copper was smelted in Egypt during the pre-dynastic period, and bronze came into use after 3000 BC at the latest in Egypt and Nubia. Nubia was a major source of copper as well as gold. The use of gold and silver in Egypt dates back to the pre-dynastic period. In the Air Mountains, present-day Niger, Copper was smelted independently of developments in the Nile Valley between 3000 and 2500 BC. The process used was unique to the region, indicating that it was not brought from outside the region, it became more mature by about 1500 BC. Carthage By the first millennium BC, Iron working had been introduced in northwestern Africa, Egypt, and Nubia. According to Zangata and Hall, there is evidence of iron smelting in the Central African Republic and Cameroon that may date back to 3000 to 2500 BC. In 670 BC, Nubians were pushed out of Egypt by Assyrians using iron weapons, 
after which the use of iron in the Nile Valley became widespread. Role of the Berbers the theory of iron spreading to sub-Saharan Africa via the Nubian city of Mero is no longer widely accepted. Metalworking in West Africa has been dated as early as 2500 BC at Agoro west of the Termit in Niger, and ironworking was practiced there by 1500 BC. In Central Africa, there is evidence that iron working may have been practiced as early as the 3rd millennium BC. Iron smelting was developed in the area between Lake Chad and the African Great Lakes between 1600 BC, long before it reached Egypt. Before 500 BC, the Nok culture in the Jos Plateau was already smelting iron. German Cameroon, German East Africa German Southwest Africa, German Togoland. The ancient history of North Africa is inextricably linked to that of the ancient Near East. This is particularly true of ancient Egypt and Nubia. In the Horn of Africa the Kingdom of Aksum ruled modern-day Eritrea, northern Ethiopia, and the coastal area of the western part of the Arabian Peninsula. The ancient Egyptians established ties with the land of Punt in 2350 BC. Punt was a trade partner of ancient Egypt and it is believed that it was located in modern-day Somalia, Djibouti, or Eritrea. Phoenician cities such as Carthage were part of the Mediterranean Iron Age and classical antiquity. Sub-Saharan Africa developed more or less independently in those times. After the desertification of the Sahara, settlement became concentrated in the Nile Valley, where numerous sacral chiefdoms appeared. The regions with the largest population pressure were in the Nile Delta region of Lower Egypt, in Upper Egypt, and also along the second and third cataracts of the Dongola reach of the Nile in Nubia. This population pressure and growth was brought about by the cultivation of Southwest Asian crops, including wheat and barley, and the raising of sheep, goats, and cattle. Population growth led to competition for farmland and the need to regulate farming. Regulation was established by the formation of bureaucracies among sacral chiefdoms. The first and most powerful of the chiefdoms was Tosseti founded around 3500 BC. The idea of sacral chiefdom spread throughout Upper and Lower Egypt. Italian North Africa, Eritrea, Italian Somaliland Later consolidation of the chiefdoms into broader political entities began to occur in Upper and Lower Egypt culminating into the unification of Egypt into one political entity by Narmer in 3100 BC. Instead of being viewed as a sacral chief, he became a divine king. The Henotheism, or worship of a single god within a polytheistic system, practiced in the sacral chiefdoms along Upper and Lower Egypt, became the polytheistic ancient Egyptian religion. Bureaucracies became more centralized under the pharaohs, run by viziers, governors, tax collectors, generals, artists, and technicians. They engaged in tax collecting, organizing of labor for major public works, and building irrigation systems, pyramids, temples, and canals. During the Fourth Dynasty, long-distance trade was developed with the Levant for timber, with Nubia for gold and skins, with Punt for frankincense, and also with the western Libyan territories. For most of the Old Kingdom, Egypt developed her fundamental systems, institutions, and culture, always through the central bureaucracy and by the divinity of the pharaoh. Somalia Roman North Africa Aksum West Africa After the 4th millennium BC, Egypt started to extend direct military and political control over her southern and western neighbors. 
By 2200 BC, the Old Kingdom's stability was undermined by rivalry among the governors of the gnomes who challenged the power of pharaohs and by invasions of Asiatics into the Nile Delta. The first intermediate period had begun, a time of political division and uncertainty. Liberia, founded by the American Colonization Society of the United States in 1821, declared independence in 1847, Ethiopian Empire had its borders redrawn with Italian Eritrea and French Somaliland, briefly occupied by Italy from 1936 to 1941 during the Abyssinia Crisis, Sudan, independent under Mahdi rule between 1885 and 1899. It was then under British rule from 1899 to 1956. Middle Kingdom of Egypt arose when Mentuhotep II of 11th dynasty unified the Egypt once again between 2041 and 2016 BC beginning with his conquering of 10th dynasty in 2041 BC. Pyramid building resumed, long distance trade re-emerged and the center of power moved from Memphis to Thebes. Connections with the southern regions of Kush, Verwat, and Irthet at the Second Cataract were made stronger. Then came the Second Intermediate Period, with the invasion of the Hyksos on horse-drawn chariots and utilizing bronze weapons, a technology heretofore unseen in Egypt. Horse-drawn chariots soon spread to the west in the inhabitable Sahara and North Africa. The Hyksos failed to hold on to their Egyptian territories and were absorbed by Egyptian society. This eventually led to one of Egypt's most powerful phases, the New Kingdom, with the 18th dynasty. Egypt became a superpower controlling Nubia and Judea while exerting political influence on the Libyans to the west and on the Mediterranean. As before, the new kingdom ended with invasion from the west by Libyan princes, leading to the Third Intermediate Period. Beginning with Shoshenkai, the 22nd dynasty was established. It ruled for two centuries. To the south, Nubian independence and strength was being reasserted. This reassertion led to the conquest of Egypt by Nubia, begun by Kashta and completed by Pi and Shabaka. This was the birth of the 25th dynasty of Egypt. The Nubians tried to re-establish Egyptian traditions and customs. They ruled Egypt for a hundred years. This was ended by an Assyrian invasion, with Taharqa experiencing the full might of Assyrian iron weapons. The Nubian pharaoh Tantamani was the last of the 25th dynasty. When the Assyrians and Nubians left, a new 26th dynasty emerged from Sais. It lasted until 525 BC, when Egypt was invaded by the Persians. Unlike the Assyrians, the Persians stayed. In 332, Egypt was conquered by Alexander the Great. This was the beginning of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which ended with Roman conquest in 30 BC. Pharaonic Egypt had come to an end. Around 3500 BC, one of the first sacral kingdoms to arise in the Nile was Ta Seti located in northern Nubia. Ta Seti was a powerful sacral kingdom in the Nile Valley at the first and second cataracts that exerted an influence over nearby chiefdoms based on pictorial representation ruling over Upper Egypt. Ta Seti traded as far as Syro-Palestine, as well as with Egypt. Ta Seti exported gold, copper, ostrich feathers, ebony, and ivory to the Old Kingdom. By the 32nd century BC, Ta Seti was in decline. After the of Egypt by Narmer in 3100 BC, Ta Seti was invaded by the pharaoh Horaha of the First Dynasty, destroying the final remnants of the kingdom. 
Ta Seti is affiliated with the A group culture known to archaeology. Small sacral kingdoms continued to dot the Nubian portion of the Nile for centuries after 3000 BC. Around the latter part of the third millennium, there was further consolidation of the sacral kingdoms. Two kingdoms in particular emerged, the Sai Kingdom, immediately south of Egypt, and the Kingdom of Kerma at the Third Cataract. Sometime around the 18th century BC, the Kingdom of Kerma conquered the Kingdom of Sai, becoming a serious rival to Egypt. Kerma occupied a territory from the First Cataract to the confluence of the Blue Nile, White Nile, and Atbara River. About 1575 to 1550 BC, during the latter part of the 17th dynasty, the Kingdom of Kerma invaded Egypt. The Kingdom of Kerma allied itself with the Hyksos invasion of Egypt. Bantu Expansion Egypt eventually re-energized under the 18th dynasty and conquered the Kingdom of Kerma or Kush ruling it for almost 500 years. The Kushites were Egyptianized during this period. By 1100 BC, the Egyptians had withdrawn from Kush. The region regained independence and reasserted its culture. Kush built a new religion around Amun and made Napata its spiritual center. In 730 BC, the Kingdom of Kush invaded Egypt taking over Thebes and beginning the Nubian Empire. The empire extended from Palestine to the confluence of the Blue Nile, the White Nile, and River Atbara. In 760 BC, the Kushites were expelled from Egypt by iron-wielding Assyrians. Later, the administrative capital was moved from Napata to Mero, developing a new Nubian culture. Initially, Meroites were highly Egyptianized, but they subsequently began to take on distinctive features. Nubia became a center of iron making and cotton cloth manufacturing. Egyptian writing was replaced by the Meroitic alphabet. The lion god Apedemok was added to the Egyptian pantheon of gods. Trade links to the Red Sea increased linking Nubia with Mediterranean Greece. Its architecture and art diversified, with pictures of lions, ostriches, giraffes, and elephants. Eventually, with the rise of Aksum, Nubia's trade links were broken and it suffered environmental degradation from the tree cutting required for iron production. In 350 AD, the Aksumite king Izana brought Mero to an end. The Egyptians referred to the people west of the Nile, ancestral to the Berbers, as Libyans. The Libyans were agriculturalists like the Mori of Morocco and the Numidians of central and eastern Algeria and Tunis. They were also nomadic, having the horse, and occupied the arid pastures and desert, like the Gaecheli. Berber desert nomads were typically in conflict with Berber coastal agriculturalists. Medieval and Early Modern Sao Civilization Canem Empire The Phoenicians were Mediterranean seamen in constant search for valuable metals such as copper, gold, tin, and lead. They began to populate the North African coast with settlements trading and mixing with the native Berber population. In 814 BC, Phoenicians from Tyre established the city of Carthage. By 600 BC, Carthage had become a major trading entity and power in the Mediterranean, largely through trade with tropical Africa. Carthage's prosperity fostered the growth of the Berber kingdoms, Numidia, and Mauritania. Around 500 BC, Carthage provided a strong impetus for trade with sub-Saharan Africa. Berber middlemen, who had maintained contacts with sub-Saharan Africa since the desert had desiccated, 
utilized pack animals to transfer products from oasis to oasis. Danger lurked from the Garamantes of Fez, who raided caravans. Salt and metal goods were traded for gold, slaves, beads, and ivory. The Carthaginians were rivals to the Greeks and Romans. Carthage fought the Punic Wars, three wars with Rome, the First Punic War, over Sicily, the Second Punic War, in which Hannibal invaded Europe, and the Third Punic War. Carthage lost the first two wars, and in the third it was destroyed, becoming the Roman province of Africa, with the Berber Kingdom of Numidia assisting Rome. The Roman province of Africa became a major agricultural supplier of wheat, olives, and olive oil to Imperial Rome via exorbitant taxation. Two centuries later, Rome brought the Berber kingdoms of Numidia and Mauritania under its authority. In the 420s AD, Vandals invaded North Africa and Rome lost her territories. The Berber kingdoms subsequently regained their independence. Christianity gained a foothold in Africa at Alexandria in the 1st century AD and spread to northwest Africa. By 313 AD, with the Edict of Milan, all of Rome and North Africa was Christian. Egyptians adopted Monophysite Christianity and formed the independent Coptic Church. Berbers adopted Donatist Christianity. Both groups refused to accept the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. As Carthaginian power grew, its impact on the indigenous population increased dramatically. Berber civilization was already at a stage in which agriculture, manufacturing, trade, and political organization supported several states. Trade links between Carthage and the Berbers in the interior grew, but territorial expansion also resulted in the enslavement or military recruitment of some Berbers and in the extraction of tribute from others. By the early 4th century BC, Berbers formed one of the largest element, with Gauls, of the Carthaginian army. In the revolt of the mercenaries, Berber soldiers participated from 241 to 238 BC after being unpaid following the defeat of Carthage in the First Punic War. Berbers succeeded in obtaining control of much of Carthage's North African territory, and they minted coins bearing the name Libyan, used in Greek to describe natives of North Africa. The Carthaginian state declined because of successive defeats by the Romans in the Punic Wars. In 146 BC, the city of Carthage was destroyed. As Carthaginian power waned, the influence of Berber leaders in the hinterland grew. By the 2nd century BC, several large but loosely administered Berber kingdoms had emerged. Two of them were established in Numidia behind the coastal areas controlled by Carthage. West of Numidia lay Mauritania, which extended across the Maloya River in Morocco to the Atlantic Ocean. The high point of Berber civilization, unequaled until the coming of the Almohads and Almoravid dynasty more than a millennium later, was reached during the reign of Masinissa in the 2nd century BC. After Masinissa's death in 148 BC, the Berber kingdoms were divided and reunited several times. Masinissa's line survived until 24 AD, when the remaining Berber territory was annexed to the Roman Empire. The ancestors of the Somala people were an important link in the Horn of Africa connecting the region's commerce with the rest of the ancient world. Somali sailors and merchants were the main suppliers of frankincense, myrrh, and spices, all of which were valuable luxuries to the ancient Egyptians, Phoenicians, Mycenaeans, and Babylonians. Bornu Empire In the Classical era, several flourishing Somali city-states such as Pone, Mazilan, Cape Gardafui, and Malau competed with the Sabaeans. 
Parthians and Aksumites for the rich Indo-Greco-Roman trade. Increases in urbanization and in the area under cultivation during Roman rule caused wholesale dislocations of the Berber society, forcing nomad tribes to settle or to move from their traditional rangelands. Sedentary tribes lost their autonomy and connection with the land. Berber opposition to the Roman presence was nearly constant. The Roman Emperor Trajan established a frontier in the south by encircling the Auras and Nementia mountains and building a line of forts from Vescara to Ad Majors. The defensive line extended at least as far as Castellum Dimiti, Roman Algeria's southernmost fort. Romans settled and developed the area around Sidifies in the 2nd century, but farther west the influence of Rome did not extend beyond the coast and principal military roads until much later. The Roman military presence of North Africa remained relatively small, consisting of about 28,000 troops and auxiliaries in Numidia and the two Mauritanian provinces. Starting in the 2nd century AD, these garrisons were manned mostly by local inhabitants. Aside from Carthage, urbanization in North Africa came in part with the establishment of settlements of veterans under the Roman emperors Claudius, Nerva, and Trajan. In Algeria such settlements included Tipisa, Quicol, or Curculum, Tamugati, and Sidifis. The prosperity of most towns depended on agriculture. Called the Granary of the Empire, North Africa became one of the largest exporters of grain in the empire, shipping to the provinces which did not produce cereals, like Italy and Greece. Other crops included fruit, figs, grapes, and beans. By the 2nd century AD, Olive oil rivaled cereals as an export item. The beginnings of the Roman imperial decline seemed less serious in North Africa than elsewhere. However, uprisings did take place. In 238 AD, landowners rebelled unsuccessfully against imperial fiscal policies. Sporadic tribal revolts in the Mauritanian mountains followed from 253 to 288, during the crisis of the 3rd century. The towns also suffered economic difficulties, and building activity almost ceased. The towns of Rome in North Africa had a substantial Jewish population. Some Jews had been deported from Judea or Palestine in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD for rebelling against Roman rule, others had come earlier with Punic settlers. In addition, a number of Berber tribes had converted to Judaism. Christianity arrived in the 2nd century and soon gained converts in the towns and among slaves. More than 80 bishops, some from distant frontier regions of Numidia, attended the Council of Carthage in 256. By the end of the 4th century, the settled areas had become Christianized, and some Berber tribes had converted en masse. A division in the church that came to be known as the Donatist heresy began in 313 among Christians in North Africa. The Donatists stressed the holiness of the Church and refused to accept the authority to administer the sacraments of those who had surrendered the scriptures when they were forbidden under the Emperor Diocletian. The Donatists also opposed the involvement of Constantine the Great in Church affairs in contrast to the majority of Christians who welcomed official imperial recognition. The occasionally violent Donatist controversy has been characterized as a struggle between opponents and supporters of the Roman system. The most articulate North African critic of the Donatist position, which came to be called a heresy, was Augustine, Bishop of Hippo Regius. Augustine maintained that the unworthiness of a minister did not affect the validity of the sacraments because their true minister was Jesus Christ. In his sermons and books Augustine, 
who is considered a leading exponent of Christian dogma, evolved a theory of the right of Orthodox Christian rulers to use force against schismatics and heretics. Although the dispute was resolved by a decision of an imperial commission in Carthage in 411, Donatist communities continued to exist as late as the 6th century. A decline in trade weakened Roman control. Independent kingdoms emerged in mountainous and desert areas, towns were overrun, and Berbers, who had previously been pushed to the edges of the Roman Empire, returned. Shilak Kingdom Bagirmi Kingdom During the Vandalic War, Belisarius, general of the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I based in Constantinople, landed in North Africa in 533 with 16,000 men and within a year destroyed the Vandal Kingdom. Local opposition delayed full Byzantine control of the region for 12 years, however, and when imperial control came, it was but a shadow of the control exercised by Rome. Although an impressive series of fortifications were built, Byzantine rule was compromised by official corruption, incompetence, military weakness and lack of concern in Constantinople for African affairs, which made it an easy target for the Arabs during the early Muslim conquests. As a result, many rural areas reverted to Berber rule. The earliest state in Eritrea and northern Ethiopia, DMT, dates from around the 8th and 7th centuries BC. DMT traded through the Red Sea with Egypt and the Mediterranean, providing frankincense. By the 5th and 3rd centuries, DMT had declined, and several successor states took its place. Later there was greater trade with South Arabia, mainly with the port of Saba. Adulis became an important commercial centre in the Ethiopian highlands. The interaction of the peoples in the two regions, the southern Arabia Sabaeans and the northern Ethiopians, resulted in the GEEZ culture and language and eventual development of the GEEZ script. Trade links increased and expanded from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, with Egypt, Greece and Rome, to the Black Sea and to Persia, India, and China. Aksum was known throughout those lands. By the 5th century BC, the region was very prosperous, exporting ivory, hippopotamus hides, gold dust, spices, and live elephants. It imported silver, gold, olive oil, and wine. Aksum manufactured glass crystal, brass, and copper for export. A powerful Aksum emerged, unifying parts of eastern Sudan, northern Ethiopia, and Eritrea. Its kings built stone palatial buildings and were buried under megalithic monuments. By 300 AD, Aksum was minting its own coins in silver and gold. Wada Empire in 331 AD, King Izana was converted to Monophysite Christianity, supposedly by Frumentius and Aedesius, who became stranded on the Red Sea coast. Some scholars believed the process was more complex and gradual than a simple conversion. Around 350, the time Izana sacked Mero, the Syrian monastic tradition took root within the Ethiopian church. Luba Empire Lunda Empire Kingdom of Congo Horn of Africa Somalia II Ethiopia North Africa Maghreb Nile Valley Egypt Sudan Christian and Islamic Nubia Southern Africa Great Zimbabwe and Mapungabwe In the 6th century Aksum was powerful enough to add Saba on the Arabian Peninsula to her empire. At the end of the 6th century, 
the Sasanian Empire pushed Aksum out of the peninsula. With the spread of Islam through Western Asia and Northern Africa, Aksum's trading networks in the Mediterranean faltered. The Red Sea trade diminished as it was diverted to the Persian Gulf and dominated by Arabs, causing Aksum to decline. By 800 AD, the capital was moved south into the interior highlands, and Aksum was much diminished. In the Western Sahel the rise of settled communities occurred largely as a result of the domestication of millet and of sorghum. Archaeology points to sizable urban populations in West Africa beginning in the second millennium BC. Symbiotic trade relations developed before the trans-Saharan trade, in response to the opportunities afforded by north-south diversity in ecosystems across deserts, grasslands, and forests. The agriculturists received salt from the desert nomads. The desert nomads acquired meat and other foods from pastoralists and farmers of the grasslands and from fishermen on the Niger River. The forest dwellers provided furs and meat. Dar Tichit and Walida in present-day Mauritania figure prominently among the early urban centers, dated to 2000 BC. About 500 stone settlements litter the region in the former savanna of the Sahara. Its inhabitants fished and grew millet. It has been found that the Sinink of the Monde peoples were responsible for constructing such settlements. Around 300 BC the region became more desiccated and the settlements began to decline, most likely relocating to Kumbai Sale. Architectural evidence and the comparison of pottery styles suggest that Dar Tichit was related to the subsequent Ghana Empire. Jinjano was settled around 300 BC, and the town grew to house a sizable Iron Age population, as evidenced by crowded cemeteries. Living structures were made of sun-dried mud. By 250 BC Jinjano had become a large, thriving market town. Farther south, in central Nigeria, around 1000 BC, the Nok culture developed on the Jos Plateau. It was a highly centralized community. The Nok people produced lifelike representations in terracotta, including human heads, elephants, and other animals. By 500 BC they were smelting iron. By 200 AD the Nok culture had vanished. Based on stylistic similarities with the Nok terracottas, the bronze figurines of the Yoruba Kingdom of Ifa and those of the Bini Kingdom of Benin are now believed to be continuations of the traditions of the earlier Nakite culture. The Bantu expansion was a critical movement of people in African history and the settling of the continent. People speaking Bantu languages began in the second millennium BC to spread from Cameroon eastward to the Great Lakes region. In the first millennium BC, Bantu languages spread from the Great Lakes to southern and east Africa. An early expansion was south to the upper Zambezi Valley in the second century BC. Then, Bantu speakers pushed westward to the savannas of present-day Angola and eastward into Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe in the first century AD. The second thrust from the Great Lakes was eastward. 2,000 years ago, expanding to the Indian Ocean coast, Kenya, and Tanzania. The eastern group eventually met the southern migrants from the Great Lakes in Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Both groups continued southward, with eastern groups continuing to Mozambique and reaching Maputo in the 2nd century AD, and expanding as far as Durban. By the later 1st millennium AD, the expansion had reached the Great K River of South Africa. Sorghum, a major Bantu crop, could not thrive under the winter rainfall of Namibia and the Western Cape. Khoisan people inhabited the remaining parts of southern Africa.
The Sao civilization flourished from ca. the 6th century BC to as late as the 16th century AD in Central Africa. The Sao lived by the Shari River south of Lake Chad in territory that later became part of Cameroon and Chad. They are the earliest people to have left clear traces of their presence in the territory of modern Cameroon. Today, several ethnic groups of northern Cameroon and southern Chad but particularly the Sara people claim descent from the civilization of the Sao. Sao artifacts show that they were skilled workers in bronze, copper, and iron. Finds include bronze sculptures and terracotta statues of human and animal figures, coins, funerary urns, household utensils, jewelry, highly decorated pottery, and spears. The largest Sao archaeological finds have been made south of Lake Chad. The Kanem Empire was centered in the Chad Basin. It was known as the Kanem Empire from the 9th century AD onward and lasted as the independent kingdom of Bornu until 1893. At its height it encompassed an area covering not only much of Chad, but also parts of modern southern Libya, eastern Niger, northeastern Nigeria, northern Cameroon, parts of South Sudan and the Central African Republic. The history of the empire is mainly known from the Royal Chronicle or Gergum discovered in 1851 by the German traveller Heinrich Barth. Canem rose in the 8th century in the region to the north and east of Lake Chad. The Canem Empire went into decline, shrank, and in the 14th century was defeated by Vilela invaders from the Lake Fatrai region. Around the 9th century AD, the central Sudanic Empire of Kanem, with its capital at Njimai, was founded by the Kanuri-speaking nomads. Kanem arose by engaging in the trans-Saharan trade. It exchanged slaves captured by raiding the south for horses from North Africa which in turn aided in the acquisition of slaves. By the late 11th century, the Islamic Saifawa dynasty was founded by Humay ibn Salamna. The Saifawa dynasty ruled for 771 years, making it one of the longest-lasting dynasties in human history. In addition to trade, taxation of local farms around Kanem became a source of state income. Kanem reached its peak under Maidunamadibalami ibn Salma. The empire reportedly was able to field 40,000 cavalry, and it extended from Fezzan in the north to the south state in the south. Islam became firmly entrenched in the empire. Pilgrimages to Mecca were common, Cairo had hostels set aside specifically for pilgrims from Kanem. The Kanuri people led by the Saifawa migrated to the west and south of the lake, where they established the Bornu Empire. By the late 16th century the Bornu Empire had expanded and recaptured the parts of Kanem that had been conquered by the Bulala. Satellite states of Bornu included the Damagaram in the west and Bagirmai to the southeast of Lake Chad. Around 1400, the Saifawa dynasty moved its capital to Bornu, a tributary state southwest of Lake Chad with a new capital Berni and Garzagamu. Overgrazing had caused the pastures of Kanem to become too dry. In addition, political rivalry from the Bilela clan was becoming intense. Moving to Bornu better situated the empire to exploit the trans-Saharan trade and to widen its network in that trade. Links to the house estates were also established, providing horses and salt from Bilma for Akin gold. My Ali Gazi Ibn Dunama defeated the Bilela, re-establishing complete control of Kanem. During the early 16th century, the Saifawa dynasty solidified its hold on the Bornu population after much rebellion. In the latter half of the 16th century, my Idris Aluma modernized its military, in contrast to the Songhai Empire. 
Turkish mercenaries were used to train the military. The Saifawa dynasty were the first monarchs south of the Sahara to import firearms. The empire controlled all of the Sahel from the borders of Darfur in the east to House Alan to the west. Friendly relationship was established with the Ottoman Empire via Tripoli. The Maya exchanged gifts with the Ottoman Sultan. During the 17th and 18th centuries, not much is known about Bornu. During the 18th century, it became a center of Islamic learning. However, Bornu's army became outdated by not importing new arms, and Kamembu had also begun its decline. The power of the Maya was undermined by droughts and famine that were becoming more intense, internal rebellion in the pastoralist north, growing house of power and the importation of firearms which made warfare more bloody. By 1841, the last Maya was deposed, bringing to an end the long-lived Saifawa dynasty. In its place, the al Kanamaya dynasty of the Shihu rose to power. The Shilak kingdom was centered in South Sudan from the 15th century from along a strip of land along the western bank of the White Nile from Lake No to about 12 degrees north latitude. The capital and royal residence was in the town of Fashoda. The kingdom was founded during the mid-15th century AD by its first ruler, Niu Kang. During the 19th century, the Shilak kingdom faced decline following military assaults from the Ottoman Empire and later British and Sudanese colonization in Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. The Kingdom of Bagirmai existed as an independent state during the 16th and 17th centuries southeast of Lake Chad in what is now the country of Chad. Bagirmai emerged to the southeast of the Kanem-Bornu Empire. The kingdom's first ruler was Mbang Berni Bess. Later in his reign, the Bornu Empire conquered and made the state a tributary. The Wada Empire was centered on Chad and the Central African Republic from the 17th century. The Tunjur people founded the Wada Kingdom to the east of Bornu in the 16th century. In the 17th century there was a revolt of the Maba people who established a Muslim dynasty. At first Wada paid tribute to Bornu and Durfur but by the 18th century Wada was fully independent and had become an aggressor against its neighbors. To the west of Bornu, by the 15th century the Kingdom of Kano had become the most powerful of the Hausa kingdoms, in an unstable truce with the Kingdom of Katsina to the north. Both were absorbed into the Sokoto Caliphate during the Fulani Jihad of 1805, which threatened Bornu itself. Sometime between 1300 and 1400 AD, Kongolo Mwamba from the Balapui clan unified the various Luba peoples, near Lake Kisale. He founded the Kongolo dynasty, which was later ousted by Kalala Ilunga. Kalala expanded the kingdom west of Lake Kisale. A new centralized political system of spiritual kings with a court council of head governors and subheads all the way to village heads. The Bulapwi was the direct communicator with the ancestral spirits and chosen by them. Conquered states were integrated into the system and represented in the court, with their titles. The authority of the Bulapwi resided in his spiritual power rather than his military authority. The army was relatively small. The Luba was able to control regional trade and collect tribute for redistribution. Numerous offshoot states were formed with founders claiming descent from the Luba. The Luba political system spread throughout Central Africa, Southern Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and the Western Congo. Two major empires claiming Luba descent were the Lunda Empire and Maravi Empire. 
The Bimba people and Basimba people of northern Zambia were descended from Luba migrants who arrived in Zambia during the 17th century. In the 1450s, a Luba from the royal family Ilunga Chwibinda married Lunda Queen Ruioi and united all Lunda peoples. Their son Malapwila Singh expanded the kingdom. His son Naioi expanded the empire further and is known as the first Lunda emperor, with the title Mwato Yamvo, the Lord of Vipers. The Luba political system was retained, and conquered peoples were integrated into the system. The Mwato Yamvo assigned a silol or kilolo and tax collector to each state conquered. Numerous states claimed descent from the Lunda. The Imbangala of inland Angola claimed descent from a founder, King Urai, brother of Queen Ruioi, who could not tolerate the rule of Malapui Chwibunda. King Urai became the title of kings of states founded by Queen Ruioi's brother. The Luina and Lozi in Zambia also claimed descent from King Urai. During the 17th century, a Lunda chief and warrior called Mwata Kazembe set up an eastern Lunda kingdom in the valley of the Luapula River. The Lunda's western expansion also saw claims of descent by the Yaka and the Pend. The Lunda links Central Africa with the western coast trade. The Kingdom of Lunda came to an end in the 19th century when it was invaded by the Chokwi, who were armed with guns. By the 15th century AD, the farming Bakongo people were unified as the Kingdom of Congo under a ruler called the Mani Congo, residing in the fertile pool Malbo area on the lower Congo River. The capital was Mbanza Congo. With superior organization, they were able to conquer their neighbors and extract tribute. They were experts in metalwork, pottery, and weaving raffia cloth. They stimulated inter-regional trade via a tribute system controlled by the Mani Congo. Later, maize and cassava would be introduced to the region via trade with the Portuguese at their ports at Luanda and Benguela. The maize and cassava would result in population growth in the region and other parts of Africa, replacing millet as a main staple. By the 16th century, the Mani Congo held authority from the Atlantic in the west to the Kwango River in the east. Each territory was assigned a Manimpembe by the Mani Congo. In 1506, Afonso I, a Christian, took over the throne. Slave trading increased with Afonso's wars of conquest. About 1568 to 1569, the Jaga invaded Congo, laying waste to the kingdom and forcing the Mani Congo into exile. In 1574, Mani Congo Alvaro I was reinstated with the help of Portuguese mercenaries. During the latter part of the 1660s, the Portuguese tried to gain control of Congo. Mani Congo Antonio I, with the Congolese army of 5,000, was destroyed by an army of Afro-Portuguese at the Battle of Mwila. The empire dissolved into petty polities, fighting among each other for war captives to sell into slavery. Congo gained captives from the Kingdom of Ndongo in wars of conquest. Ndongo was ruled by the Angola. Ndongo would also engage in slave trading with the Portuguese, with São Tome being a transit point to Brazil. The kingdom was not as welcoming as Congo, it viewed the Portuguese with great suspicion and as an enemy. The Portuguese in the latter part of the 16th century tried to gain control of Ndongo but were defeated by the Mbundu. Ndongo experienced depopulation from slave raiding. The leaders established another state at Matamba, affiliated with Queen Nzinga, who put up a strong resistance to the Portuguese until coming to terms with them. The Portuguese settled along the coast as trade dealers, not venturing on conquest of the interior. 
slavery wreaked havoc in the interior, with states initiating wars of conquest for captives. The Imbangala formed the slave raiding state of Kazanye, a major source of slaves during the 17th and 18th centuries. The birth of Islam opposite Somalia's Red Sea coast meant that Somali merchants and sailors living on the Arabian Peninsula gradually came under the influence of the new religion through their converted Arab Muslim trading partners. With the migration of Muslim families from the Islamic world to Somalia in the early centuries of Islam, and the peaceful conversion of the Somali population by Somali Muslim scholars in the following centuries, the ancient city-states eventually transformed into Islamic Mogadishu, Berbera, Zila, Barawa, and Merka, which were part of the Berber civilization. The city of Mogadishu came to be known as the City of Islam and controlled the East African gold trade for several centuries. During this period, sultanates such as the Ajuran Empire and the Sultanate of Mogadishu, and republics like Barawa, Merka, and Hobia and their respective ports flourished and had a lucrative foreign commerce with ships sailing to and coming from Arabia, India, Venice, Persia, Egypt, Portugal and as far away as China. Vasco da Gama, who passed by Mogadishu in the 15th century, noted that it was a large city with houses four or five stories high and big palaces in its center, in addition to many mosques with cylindrical minarets. In the 16th century, Duarte Barbosa noted that many ships from the Kingdom of Cambaya in modern-day India sailed to Mogadishu with cloth and spices, for which they in return received gold, wax, and ivory. Barbosa also highlighted the abundance of meat, wheat, barley, horses, and fruit in the coastal markets, which generated enormous wealth for the merchants. Mogadishu the center of a thriving weaving industry known as Tug Benadur, together with Merka and Barawa, served as a transit stop for Swahili merchants from Mombasa and Malindi and for the gold trade from Kilwe. Jewish merchants from the Strait of Hormuz brought their Indian textiles and fruit to the Somali coast to exchange for grain and wood. Trading relations were established with Malacca in the 15th century, with cloth, ambergris, and porcelain being the main commodities of the trade. Giraffes, zebras, and incense were exported to the Ming Empire of China, which established Somali merchants as leaders in the commerce between the Asia and Africa and influenced the Chinese language with borrowings from the Somali language in the process. Hindu merchants from Surat and Southeast African merchants from Pate, seeking to bypass both the Portuguese blockade and Omani meddling, used the Somali ports of Merka and Barawa to conduct their trade in safety and without any problems. The Zagwa dynasty ruled many parts of modern Ethiopia and Eritrea from approximately 1137 to 1270. The name of the dynasty comes from the Cushitic speaking Aga of northern Ethiopia. From 1270 AD and on for many centuries, the Solomonic dynasty ruled the Ethiopian Empire. In the early 15th century, Ethiopia sought to make diplomatic contact with European kingdoms for the first time since Aksumite times. A letter from King Henry IV of England to the Emperor of Abyssinia survives. In 1428, the Emperor Yashakai sent two emissaries to Alfonso V of Aragon, who sent return emissaries who failed to complete the return trip. The first continuous relations with a European country began in 1508 with the Kingdom of Portugal under Emperor Lebna Dengel, who had just inherited the throne from his father. This proved to be an important development, for when the empire was subjected to the attacks of the Adal general and Imam, Ahmed ibn Ibrahim al-Ghazi, 
Portugal assisted the Ethiopian emperor by sending weapons and 400 men, who helped his son Galatuas defeat Ahmed and re-establish his rule. This Abyssinian Adal War was also one of the first proxy wars in the region as the Ottoman Empire, and Portugal took sides in the conflict. When Emperor Sisinius converted to Roman Catholicism in 1624, years of revolt and civil unrest followed resulting in thousands of deaths. The Jesuit missionaries had offended the Orthodox faith of the local Ethiopians, and on June 25, 1632, Sisinius's son, Emperor Facilities, declared the state religion to again be Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity and expelled the Jesuit missionaries and other Europeans. By 711 AD, the Umayyad Caliphate had conquered all of North Africa. By the 10th century, the majority of the population of North Africa was Muslim. By the 9th century AD, the unity brought about by the Islamic conquest of North Africa and the expansion of Islamic culture came to an end. Conflict arose as to who should be the successor of the Prophet. The Umayyads had initially taken control of the Caliphate, with their capital at Damascus. Later, the Abbasids had taken control, moving the capital to Baghdad. The Berber people, being independent in spirit and hostile to outside interference in their affairs and to Arab exclusivity in Orthodox Islam, adopted Shiite and Kurajite Islam, both considered unorthodox and hostile to the authority of the Abbasid Caliphate. Numerous Kurajite kingdoms came and fell during the 8th and 9th centuries, asserting their independence from Baghdad. In the early 10th century, Shiite groups from Syria, claiming descent from Muhammad's daughter Fatima, founded the Fatimid dynasty in the Maghrib. By 950, they had conquered all of the Maghrib and by 969 all of Egypt. They had immediately broken away from Baghdad. In an attempt to bring about a purer form of Islam among the Sanyaja Berbers, Abdallah Ibn Yasin founded the Al Moravid movement in present day Mauritania and Western Sahara. The Sanyaja Berbers, like the Sinink, practiced an indigenous religion alongside Islam. Abdallah Ibn Yasin found ready converts in the Lamtuna Sanyaja, who were dominated by the Sinink in the south and the Zanata Berbers in the north. By the 1040s, all of the Lamtuna was converted to the Al Moravid movement. With the help of Yahya ibn Umar and his brother Abu Bakr ibn Umar, the sons of the Lamtuna chief, the Al Moravids created an empire extending from the Sahel to the Mediterranean. After the death of Abdallah ibn Yasin and Yahya ibn Umar, Abu Bakr split the empire in half between himself and Yusuf ibn Tashfin, because it was too big to be ruled by one individual. Abu Bakr took the south to continue fighting the Sinink, and Yusuf ibn Tashfin took the north, expanding it to southern Spain. The death of Abu Bakr in 1087 saw a breakdown of unity and increased military dissension in the south. This caused a re-expansion of the Sinink. The Almoravids were once held responsible for bringing down the Ghana Empire in 1076, but this view is no longer credited. During the 10th through 13th centuries, there was a large-scale movement of Bedouins out of the Arabian Peninsula. About 1050, a quarter of a million Arab nomads from Egypt moved into the Maghrib. Those following the northern coast were referred to as Banu Hilal. Those going south of the Atlas Mountains were the Banu Sulaim. This movement spread the use of the Arabic language and hastened the decline of the Berber language and the Arabization of North Africa. Later an Arabist Berber group, the Haywara, went south to Nubia via Egypt. 
In the 1140s, Abd al Mumin declared jihad on the Al Moravids, charging them with decadence and corruption. He united the northern Berbers against the Al Moravids, overthrowing them and forming the Al Mohad Empire. During this period, the Maghreb became thoroughly Islamist and saw the spread of literacy, the development of algebra, and the use of the number zero and decimals. By the 13th century, the Almohad states had split into three rival states. Muslim states were largely extinguished in the Iberian Peninsula by the Christian kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, and Portugal. Around 1415, Portugal engaged in a reconquista of North Africa by capturing Ceuta, and in later centuries Spain and Portugal acquired other ports on the North African coast. In 1492, at the end of the Granada War, Spain defeated Muslims in the Emirate of Granada, effectively ending eight centuries of Muslim domination in southern Iberia. Portugal and Spain took the ports of Tangiers, Algiers, Tripoli, and Tunis. This put them in direct competition with the Ottoman Empire, which retook the ports using Turkish corsairs. The Turkish corsairs would use the ports for raiding Christian ships, a major source of booty for the towns. Technically, North Africa was under the control of the Ottoman Empire, but only the coastal towns were fully under Istanbul's control. Tripoli benefited from trade with Borno. The Pashas of Tripoli traded horses, firearms, and armor via Fez with the sultans of the Bornu Empire for slaves. In the 16th century, an Arab nomad tribe that claimed descent from Muhammad's daughter, the Saudis, conquered and united Morocco. They prevented the Ottoman Empire from reaching to the Atlantic and expelled Portugal from Morocco's western coast. Ahmed al-Mansur brought the state to the height of its power. He invaded Songhai in 1591, to control the gold trade, which had been diverted to the western coast of Africa for European ships and to the east, to Tunis. Morocco's hold on Songhai diminished in the 17th century. In 1603, after Ahmed's death, the kingdom split into the two sultanates of Fes and Marrakesh. Later it was reunited by Muli al-Rashid, founder of the Alawite dynasty. His brother and successor, Ismail ibn Sharif, strengthened the unity of the country by importing slaves from the Sudan to build up the military. In 642 AD, the Rashidun Caliphate conquered Byzantine Egypt. Egypt under the Fatimid Caliphate was prosperous. Dams and canals were repaired, and wheat, barley, flax, and cotton production increased. Egypt became a major producer of linen and cotton cloth. Its Mediterranean and Red Sea trade increased. Egypt also minted a gold currency called the Fatimid dinar, which was used for international trade. The bulk of revenues came from taxing the fellaheen, and taxes were high. Tax collecting was leased to Berber overlords, who were soldiers who had taken part in the Fatimid conquest in 969 AD. The overlords paid a share to the caliphs and retained what was left. Eventually, they became landlords and constituted a settled land aristocracy. To fill the military ranks, Mamluk Turkish slave cavalry and Sudanese slave infantry were used. Berber freemen were also recruited. In the 1150s, tax revenues from farms diminished. The soldiers revolted and wreaked havoc in the countryside, slowed trade, and diminished the power and authority of the Fatimid caliphs. During the 1160s, Fatimid Egypt came under threat from European crusaders. Out of this threat, 
a Kurdish general named al Adn Ishav Ibn Ib, with a small band of professional soldiers, emerged as an outstanding Muslim defender. Saladin defeated the Christian crusaders at Egypt's borders and recaptured Jerusalem in 1187. On the death of al Adid, the last Fatimid caliph, in 1171, Saladin became the ruler of Egypt, ushering in the Ayyubid dynasty. Under his rule, Egypt returned to Sunni Islam, Cairo became an important center of Arab Islamic learning, and Mamluk slaves were increasingly recruited from Turkey and southern Russia for military service. Support for the military was tied to the ICTA a form of land taxation in which soldiers were given ownership in return for military service. Over time, Mamluk slave soldiers became a very powerful landed aristocracy, to the point of getting rid of the Ayyubid dynasty in 1250 and establishing a Mamluk dynasty. The more powerful Mamluks were referred to as Amirs. For 250 years, Mamluks controlled all of Egypt under a military dictatorship. Egypt extended her territories to Syria and Palestine, thwarted the Crusaders, and halted a Mongol invasion in 1260 at the Battle of Anjalut. Mamluk Egypt came to be viewed as a protector of Islam, and of Medina and Mecca. Eventually the ICTA system declined and proved unreliable for providing an adequate military. The Mamluks started viewing their ICTA as hereditary and became attuned to urban living. Farm production declined, and dams and canals lapsed into disrepair. Mamluk military skill and technology did not keep pace with new technology of handguns and cannons. With the rise of the Ottoman Empire, Egypt was easily defeated. In 1517, at the end of an Ottoman Mamluk War, Egypt became part of the Ottoman Empire. The Istanbul government revived the ICTA system. Trade was re-established in the Red Sea, but it could not completely connect with the Indian Ocean trade because of growing Portuguese presence. During the 17th and 18th centuries, hereditary Mamluks regained power. The leading Mamluks were referred to as Beys. Pashas, or viceroys, represented the Istanbul government in name only, operating independently. During the 18th century, dynasties of Pashas became established. The government was weak and corrupt. In 1798, Napoleon invaded Egypt. The local forces had little ability to resist the French conquest. However, the British Empire and the Ottoman Empire were able to remove French occupation in 1801. These events marked the beginning of a 19th century Anglo Franco rivalry over Egypt. After Izana of Aksum sacked Mero, people associated with the site of Balana moved into Nubia from the southwest and founded three kingdoms, Makuria, Nobatia, and Alodia. They would rule for 200 years. Makuria was above the Third Cataract, along the Dongola Reach with its capital at Dongola. Nobadiah was to the north with its capital at Faris and Alodia was to the south with its capital at Soba. Makuria eventually absorbed Nobadaya. The people of the region converted to Monophysite Christianity around 500 to 600 CE. The church initially started writing in Coptic, then in Greek, and finally in Old Nubian, a Nilo-Saharan language. The church was aligned with the Egyptian Coptic Church. By 641, Egypt was conquered by the Rashidun Caliphate. This effectively blocked Christian Nubia and Aksum from Mediterranean Christendom. In 651-652, 
Arabs from Egypt invaded Christian Nubia. Nubian archers soundly defeated the invaders. The Bakht Treaty was drawn, recognizing Christian Nubia and regulating trade. The treaty controlled relations between Christian Nubia and Islamic Egypt for almost 600 years. By the 13th century, Christian Nubia began its decline. The authority of the monarchy was diminished by the church and nobility. Arab Bedouin tribes began to infiltrate Nubia, causing further havoc. Fakirs practicing Sufism introduced Islam into Nubia. By 1366, Nubia had become divided into petty fiefdoms when it was invaded by Mamluks. During the 15th century, Nubia was open to Arab immigration. Arab nomads intermingled with the population and introduced the Arab culture and the Arabic language. By the 16th century, Makuria and Nobadiah had been Islamized. During the 16th century, Abdallah Jama headed an Arab confederation that destroyed Soba, capital of Alodia, the last holdout of Christian Nubia. Later Alodia would fall under the Funjay Sultanate. During the 15th century, Funjay herders migrated north to Alodia and occupied it. Between 1504 and 1505, the kingdom expanded, reaching its peak and establishing its capital at center under Badi II Abu Dagn. By the end of the 16th century, the Funjay had converted to Islam. They pushed their empire westward to Kordofan. They expanded eastward, but were halted by Ethiopia. They controlled Nubia down to the Third Cataract. The economy depended on captured enemies to fill the army and on merchants traveling through center. Under Badi IV, the army turned on the king, making him nothing but a figurehead. In 1821, the Funjay were conquered by Muhammad Ali, Pasha of Egypt. Settlements of Bantu-speaking peoples who were iron-using agriculturists and herdsmen were present south of the Limpopo River by the 4th or 5th century CE, displacing and absorbing the original Khoisan speakers. They slowly moved south, and the earliest ironworks in modern-day KwaZulu-Natal province are believed to date from around 1050. The southernmost group was the Kosa people, whose language incorporates certain linguistic traits from the earlier Khoisan people, reaching the Great Fish River in today's Eastern Cape Province. The Kingdom of Mapungabwe was the first state in southern Africa, with its capital at Mapungabwe. The state arose in the 12th century CE. Its wealth came from controlling the trade in ivory from the Limpopo Valley, copper from the mountains of northern Transvaal, and gold from the Zimbabwe plateau between the Limpopo and Zambezi rivers, with the Swahili merchants at Chibuene. By the mid-13th century, Mapungabwe was abandoned. After the decline of Mapungabwe, Great Zimbabwe rose on the Zimbabwe plateau. Zimbabwe means stone building. Great Zimbabwe was the first city in southern Africa and was the center of an empire, consolidating lesser Shona polities. Stone building was inherited from Mapungabwe. These building techniques were enhanced and came into maturity at Great Zimbabwe, represented by the wall of the Great Enclosure. The dry stack stone masonry technology was also used to build smaller compounds in the area. Great Zimbabwe flourished by trading with Swahili Kilwe and Sofala. The rise of Great Zimbabwe parallels the rise of Kilwe. Great Zimbabwe was a major source of gold. Its royal court lived in luxury, wore Indian cotton, surrounded themselves with copper and gold ornaments, and ate on plates from as far away as Persia and China. 
Around the 1420s and 1430s, Great Zimbabwe was on decline. The city was abandoned by 1450. Some have attributed the decline to the rise of the trading town in Gomild. A new chapter of Shona history ensued. Niatsimba Mutoda, a northern Shona king of the Kernga, engaged in conquest. He and his son Mutope conquered the Zimbabwe Plateau, going through Mozambique to the east coast, linking the empire to the coastal trade. They called their empire Wileatuel Muana Mutapa or Mwana Mutapa, or the Kingdom of Mutapa. Monomotapa was the Portuguese corruption. They did not build stone structures, the northern Shonas had no traditions of building in stone. After the death of Matope in 1480, the empire split into two small empires, Torway in the south and Mutapa in the north. The split occurred over rivalry from two Shona lords, Changa and Togwe, with the Mwana Mutapa line. Changa was able to acquire the south, forming the kingdom of Butua with its capital at Kami. The Mutapa Empire continued in the north under the Mwana Mutapa line. During the 16th century the Portuguese were able to establish permanent markets up the Zambezi River in an attempt to gain political and military control of Mutapa. They were partially successful. In 1628, a decisive battle allowed them to put a puppet Mwana Mutapa named Mavura, who signed treaties that gave favorable mineral export rights to the Portuguese. The Portuguese were successful in destroying the Mwana Mutapa system of government and undermining trade. By 1667, Mutapa was in decay. Chiefs would not allow digging for gold because of fear of Portuguese theft, and the population declined. The Kingdom of Butua was ruled by a Changamire, a title derived from the founder, Changa. Later it became the Rizwai Empire. The Portuguese tried to gain a foothold but were thrown out of the region in 1693, by Changamire Dombo. The 17th century was a period of peace and prosperity. The Rizwai Empire fell into ruins in the 1830s from invading Nguni from Natal. By 1500 AD, most of southern Africa had established states. In northwestern Namibia, the Ovambo engaged in farming and the Herero engaged in herding. As cattle numbers increased, the Herero moved southward to central Namibia for grazing land. A related group, the Ovambandaru, expanded to Ganzi in northwestern Botswana. The Nama, a Khoi speaking, sheep-raising group, moved northward and came into contact with the Herero, this would set the stage for much conflict between the two groups. The expanding Loza states pushed the Mbukushu, Subaya and Ye Tabodii, Akavango, and Chobe in northern Botswana. The development of Sothotswana states based on the High Felt, south of the Limpopo River, began around 1000 CE. The chief's power rested on cattle and his connection to the ancestor. This can be seen in the Dautswamagala hill settlements with stone foundations and stone walls, north of the High Felt and south of the Vol River. Northwest of the Vol River developed early Tswana states centered on towns of thousands of people. When disagreements or rivalry arose, different groups moved to form their own states. Southeast of the Drakensberg Mountains lived Nguni-speaking peoples. They too engaged in state building, with new states developing from rivalry, disagreements and population pressure causing movement into new regions. This 19th century process of warfare, state building and migration later became known as the Mfakane or Difakan. 
Its major catalyst was the consolidation of the Zulu Kingdom. They were metal workers, cultivators of millet, and cattle herders. The Khoisan lived in the southwestern Cape Province, where winter rainfall is plentiful. Earlier Khoisan populations were absorbed by Bantu peoples, such as the Sotho and Nguni, but the Bantu expansion stopped at the region with winter rainfall. Some Bantu languages have incorporated the click consonant of the Khoisan languages. The Khoisan traded with their Bantu neighbors, providing cattle, sheep, and hunted items. In return, their Bantu-speaking neighbors traded copper, iron, and tobacco. By the 16th century, the Dutch East India Company established a replenishing station at Table Bay for restocking water and purchasing meat from the Khoikhoi. The Khoikhoi received copper, iron, tobacco, and beads in exchange. In order to control the price of meat and stock and make service more consistent, the Dutch established a permanent settlement at Table Bay in 1652. They grew fresh fruit and vegetables and established a hospital for sick sailors. To increase produce, the Dutch decided to increase the number of farms at Table Bay by encouraging free burger boars on lands worked initially by slaves from West Africa. The land was taken from Khoikhoi grazing land triggering the first Khoikhoi Dutch War in 1659. No victors emerged, but the Dutch assumed a right of conquest by which they claimed all of the Cape. In a series of wars pitting the Khoikhoi against each other, the Boers assumed all Khoikhoi land and claimed all their cattle. The second Khoikhoi Dutch War was a cattle raid. The Khoikhoi also died in thousands from European diseases. Namibia South Africa and Botswana Sothotswana Nguni peoples Khoisan and Afrikaner Southeast Africa Prehistory 2 Swahili Coast By the 18th century the Cape Colony had grown, with slaves coming from Madagascar, Mozambique, and Indonesia. The settlement also started to expand northward, but Khoikhoi resistance, raids, and guerrilla warfare slowed the expansion during the 18th century. Boers who started to practice pastoralism were known as Trek Boers. A common source of Trek Boer labor was orphan children who were captured during raids and whose parents had been killed. According to the theory of recent African origin of modern humans, the mainstream position held within the scientific community, all humans originate from either Southeast Africa or the Horn of Africa. During the first millennium CE, Nilotic and Bantu speaking peoples moved into the region. Following the Bantu migration, on the coastal section of Southeast Africa, a mixed Bantu community developed through contact with Muslim Arab and Persian traders, leading to the development of the mixed Arab, Persian, and African Swahili city-states. The Swahili culture that emerged from these exchanges evinces many Arab and Islamic influences not seen in traditional Bantu culture as do the many Afro-Arab members of the Bantu Swahili people. With its original speech community centered on the coastal parts of Tanzania and Kenya a seaboard referred to as the Swahili coast the Bantu Swahili language contains many Arabic language loanwords as a consequence of these interactions. The earliest Bantu inhabitants of the southeast coast of Kenya and Tanzania encountered by these later Arab and Persian settlers have been variously identified with the trading settlements of Rapta, Azania, and Menaudi as referenced in early Greek and Chinese writings from 50 AD to 500 AD, ultimately giving rise to the name for Tanzania. These early writings perhaps document the first wave of Bantu settlers to reach Southeast Africa during their migration. 
Historically, the Swahili people could be found as far north as northern Kenya and as far south as the Ruvuma River in Mozambique. Arab geographers referred to the Swahili coast as the land of the Zanje. Although once believed to be the descendants of Persian colonists, the ancient Swahili are now recognized by most historians, historical linguists, and archaeologists as a Bantu people who had sustained important interactions with Muslim merchants, beginning in the late 7th and early 8th centuries AD. Medieval Swahili kingdoms are known to have had island trade ports, described by Greek historians as metropolises, and to have established regular trade routes with the Islamic world and Asia. Ports such as Mombasa, Zanzibar, and Kilwe were known to Chinese sailors under Zheng He and medieval Islamic geographers such as the Berber traveller Abu Abdullah ibn Batida. The main Swahili exports were ivory, slaves, and gold. They traded with Arabia, India, Persia, and China. The Portuguese arrived in 1498. On a mission to economically control and Christianize the Swahili coast, the Portuguese attacked Kilwe first in 1505 and other cities later. Because of Swahili resistance, the Portuguese attempt at establishing commercial control was never successful. By the late 17th century, Portuguese authority on the Swahili coast began to diminish. With the help of Omani Arabs, by 1729 the Portuguese presence had been removed. The Swahili coast eventually became part of the Sultanate of Oman. Trade recovered, but it did not regain the levels of the past. The Urwe culture developed and spread in and around the Lake Victoria region of Africa during the African Iron Age. The culture's earliest dated artifacts are located in the Kagera region of Tanzania, and it extended as far west as the Kivu region of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, as far east as the Nyanza and western provinces of Kenya, and north into Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. Sites from the Urwe culture date from the early Iron Age, from the 5th century BC to the 6th century AD. The origins of the Urwe culture are ultimately in the Bantu expansion originating in Cameroon. Research into early Iron Age civilizations in sub-Saharan Africa has been undertaken concurrently with studies on African linguistics on Bantu expansion. The Urwe culture may correspond to the eastern subfamily of Bantu languages, spoken by the descendants of the first wave of Bantu peoples to settle East Africa. At first sight, Urwe seems to be a fully developed civilization recognizable through its distinctive, stylish earthenware and highly technical and sophisticated iron working techniques. Given our current level of knowledge, neither seems to have developed or altered for nearly 2,000 years. However, minor local variations in the ceramic ware can be observed. Urwe is the name of the site in Kenya brought to prominence through the publication in 1948 of Mary Leakey's Archaeological Findings. She described the early Iron Age period in the Great Lakes region in Central East Africa around Lake Victoria. Madagascar was apparently first settled by Austronesian speakers from Southeast Asia before the 6th century AD and subsequently by Bantu speakers from the East African mainland in the 6th or 7th century, according to archaeological and linguistic data. The Austronesians introduced banana and rice cultivation, and the Bantu speakers introduced cattle and other farming practices. About the year 1000, Arab and Indian trade settlement were started in northern Madagascar to exploit the Indian Ocean trade. By the 14th century, Islam was introduced on the island by traders. 
Madagascar functioned in the East African medieval period as a contact port for the other Swahili seaport city-states such as Sofala, Kilwe, Mombasa, and Zanzibar. Several kingdoms emerged after the 15th century, the Sakalava Kingdom on the west coast, Sitambala Kingdom on the east coast, and Marina in the central highlands. By the 19th century, Marina controlled the whole island. In 1500, the Portuguese were the first Europeans on the island, raiding the trading settlements. The British and later the French arrived. During the latter part of the 17th century, Madagascar was a popular transit point for pirates. Radama I invited Christian missionaries in the early 19th century. Queen Ranavalona I the cruel banned the practice of Christianity in the kingdom, and an estimated 150,000 Christians perished. Under Radama II, Madagascar took a French orientation, with great commercial concession given to the French. In 1895, in the Second Franco-Hova War, the French invaded Madagascar, taking over Ansarayana and declaring Madagascar a protectorate. Between the 14th and 15th centuries, large Southeast African kingdoms and states emerged, such as the Buganda and Karagwe kingdoms of Uganda and Tanzania. By 1000 AD, Numerous states had arisen on the lake plateau among the Great Lakes of East Africa. Cattle herding, cereal growing, and banana cultivation were the economic mainstays of these states. The Entasi and Bigo earthworks are representative of one of the first states, the Bunyoro Kingdom, which oral tradition stipulates was part of the empire of Kittera that dominated the whole lakes region. A Luo ethnic elite, from the Beto clan, ruled over the Bantu-speaking Nero people. The society was essentially Nero in its culture, based on the evidence from pottery, settlement patterns, and economic specialization. The Beto clan claimed legitimacy by being descended from the Bakweza clan, who were said to have ruled the empire of Kittera. However, very little is known about Kittera, some scholars even question its historical existence. Most founding leaders of the various polities in the lake region seem to have claimed descent from the Bakwezi. There are now 13 million Terra who are part of the second African loss. The Buganda Kingdom was founded by Cato Kinto around the 14th century AD. Cato Kintu may have migrated to the northwest of Lake Victoria as early as 1000 BC. Buganda was ruled by the Kabeka with a Bataka composed of the clan heads. Over time, the Kabekas diluted the authority of the Bataka, with Buganda becoming a centralized monarchy. By the 16th century, Buganda was engaged in expansion but had a serious rival in Bunyoro. By the 1870s, Buganda was a wealthy nation-state. The Kabekar ruled with his Lukako. Buganda had a naval fleet of a hundred vessels, each manned by 30 men. Buganda supplanted Bunyoro as the most important state in the region. However, by the early 20th century, Buganda became a province of the British Uganda Protectorate. Southeast of Bunyoro, near Lake Kivu at the bottom of the Western Rift, the Kingdom of Rwanda was founded, perhaps during the 17th century. Tutsi pastoralists formed the elite, with a king called the Mwami. The Hutu were farmers. Both groups spoke the same language, but there were strict social norms against marrying each other and interaction. According to oral tradition, the Kingdom of Rwanda was founded by Mwami Ruganza II, with his capital near Kigali. It took 200 years to attain a truly centralized kingdom under Mwami Kigali IV. 
subjugation of the Hutu proved more difficult than subduing the Tutsi. The last Tutsi chief gave up to Mwami Mutara II in 1852, but the last Hutu holdout was conquered in the 1920s by Mwami Uiv. South of the Kingdom of Rwanda was the Kingdom of Burundi. It was founded by the Tutsi chief Enter Rush ATSI. Like Rwanda, Burundi was built on cattle raised by Tutsi pastoralists, crops from Hutu farmers, conquest, and political innovations. Under Mwami Enteri Ruga Amba, Burundi pursued an aggressive expansionist policy, one based more on diplomacy than force. The Maravi claimed descent from Karanga, who took that title as king. The Maravi connected Central Africa to the East Coastal trade, with Swahili Kilwe. By the 17th century, the Maravi Empire encompassed all the area between Lake Malawi and the mouth of the Zambezi River. The Karanga was Mzura, who did much to extend the empire. Mzura made a pact with the Portuguese to establish a 4,000-man army to attack the Shona in return for aid in defeating his rival Lundi, a chief of the Zimba. In 1623, he turned on the Portuguese and assisted the Shona. In 1640, he welcomed back the Portuguese for trade. The Maravi Empire did not long survive the death of Mzura. By the 18th century, it had broken into its previous polities. The Ghana Empire may have been an established kingdom as early as the 4th century AD, founded among the Sinink by Dinj Sisa. Ghana was first mentioned by Arab geographer Al-Farazi in the late 8th century. Ghana was inhabited by urban dwellers and rural farmers. The urban dwellers were the administrators of the empire, who were Muslims, and the Ghana, who practiced traditional religion. Two towns existed, one where the Muslim administrators and Berber Arabs lived, which was connected by a stone-paved road to the king's residence. The rural dwellers lived in villages which joined together into broader polities that pledged loyalty to the Ghana. The Ghana was viewed as divine, and his physical well-being reflected on the whole society. Ghana converted to Islam around 1050, after conquering Adidagost. The Ghana Empire grew wealthy by taxing the trans-Saharan trade that linked Tyarat and Sigil Mesa to Adidagost. Ghana controlled access to the gold fields of Bambuk, southeast of Kumbai Saleh. A percentage of salt and gold going through its territory was taken. The empire was not involved in production. By the 11th century, Ghana was in decline. It was once thought that the sacking of Kumbai Saleh by Berbers under the Almoravid dynasty in 1076 was the cause. This is no longer accepted. Several alternative explanations are cited. One important reason is the transfer of the gold trade east to the Niger River and the Tagaza Trail, and Ghana's consequent economic decline. Another reason cited is political instability through rivalry among the different hereditary polities. The empire came to an end in 1230 when Takrar in northern Senegal took over the capital. The Mali Empire began in the 13th century AD, when a Mande leader, Sundiata of the Kita clan, defeated Sumauro Kanti, king of the Sasso or Southern Sinink, at the Battle of Kyrina in C. 1235. Sundiata continued his conquest from the fertile forests and Niger Valley, east to the Niger Bend, north into the Sahara, and west to the Atlantic Ocean, absorbing the remains of the Ghana Empire. Sundiata took on the title of Mansa. He established the capital of his empire at Niani. 
Although the salt and gold trade continued to be important to the Mali Empire, agriculture and pastoralism was also critical. The growing of sorghum, millet and rice was a vital function. On the northern borders of the Sahel, grazing cattle, sheep, goats and camels were major activities. Monde society was organized around the village and land. A cluster of villages was called a kafu, ruled by a farma. The farma paid tribute to the mansa. A dedicated army of elite cavalry and infantry maintained order, commanded by the royal court. A formidable force could be raised from tributary regions, if necessary. Conversion to Islam was a gradual process. The power of the Mansa depended on upholding traditional beliefs and a spiritual foundation of power. Sundiata initially kept Islam at bay. Later Mansas were devout Muslims but still acknowledged traditional deities and took part in traditional rituals and festivals, which were important to the Monde. Islam became a court religion under Sundiata's son Uli I. Mansa Uli made a pilgrimage to Mecca becoming recognized within the Muslim world. The court was staffed with literate Muslims as secretaries and accountants. Muslim traveler Ibn Battida left vivid descriptions of the empire. Mali reached the peak of its power and extent in the 14th century, when Mansa Musa made his famous hatch to Mecca with 500 slaves, each holding a bar of gold worth 500 mitkals. Mansa Musa's Hajj devalued gold in Mamluk Egypt for a decade. He made a great impression on the minds of the Muslim and European world. He invited scholars and architects like Ishal Altujan to further integrate Mali into the Islamic world. The Mali Empire saw an expansion of learning and literacy. In 1285, Sakura, a freed slave, usurped the throne. This Mansa drove the Tuareg out of Timbuktu and established it as a center of learning and commerce. The book trade increased, and book copying became a very respectable and profitable profession. Timbuktu engine became important centers of learning within the Islamic world. After the reign of Mansa Suleiman, Mali began its spiral downward. Masi cavalry raided the exposed southern border. Tuareg harassed the northern border in order to retake Timbuktu. Fulani eroded Mali's authority in the west by establishing the independent imamate of Fuda Toro, a successor to the kingdom of Takrar. Sirer and Wolof alliances were broken. In 1545-1546, the Songhai Empire took Niani. After 1599, the empire lost the Bambuk gold fields and disintegrated into petty polities. The Songhai people are descended from fishermen on the Middle Niger River. They established their capital at Kukiya in the 9th century AD and at Gao in the 12th century. The Songhai speak a Nilo Saharan language. Sunni Ali, a Songhai, began his conquest by capturing Timbuktu in 1468 from the Tuareg. He extended the empire to the north, deep into the desert, pushed the Masi further south of the Niger, and expanded southwest to Jin. His army consisted of cavalry and a fleet of canoes. Sunni Ali was not a Muslim and he was portrayed negatively by Berber Arab scholars, especially for attacking Muslim Timbuktu. After his death in 1492, his heirs were deposed by General Muhammad Tur, a Muslim of Sinink origins. Muhammad Tur founded the Askia dynasty, Askia being the title of the king. He consolidated the conquests of Sunni Ali. Islam was used to extend his authority by declaring jihad on the Masi, reviving the trans-Saharan trade, 
and having the Abbasid Shadow Caliph in Cairo declare him as Caliph of Sudan. He established Timbuktu as a great center of Islamic learning. Muhammad Tur expanded the empire by pushing the Tuareg north, capturing Air in the east, and capturing salt-producing Tagaza. He brought the house estates into the Songhai trading network. He further centralized the administration of the empire by selecting administrators from loyal servants and families and assigning them to conquered territories. They were responsible for raising local militias. Centralization made Songhai very stable, even during dynastic disputes. Leo Africanus left vivid descriptions of the empire under Askia Muhammad. Askia Muhammad was deposed by his son in 1528. After much rivalry, Muhammad Tur's last son Askia Daud assumed the throne. In 1591, Morocco invaded the Songhai Empire under Ahmed al-Mansur of the Saudi dynasty in order to secure the gold fields of the Sahel. At the Battle of Tondabai, the Songhai army was defeated. The Moroccans captured Jin, Gao, and Timbuktu, but they were unable to secure the whole region. Askia Nuhu and the Songhai army regrouped at Dendi in the heart of Songhai territory where a spirited guerrilla resistance sapped the resources of the Moroccans, who were dependent upon constant resupply from Morocco. Songhai split into several states during the 17th century. Morocco found its venture unprofitable. The gold trade had been diverted to Europeans on the coast. Most of the trans-Saharan trade was now diverted east to Bornu. Expensive equipment purchased with gold had to be sent across the Sahara, an unsustainable scenario. The Moroccans who remained married into the population and were referred to as Arma or Ruma. They established themselves at Timbuktu as a military caste with various fiefs, independent from Morocco. Amid the chaos, other groups began to assert themselves, including the Fulani of Feuda Toro who encroached from the west. The Bambara Empire, one of the states that broke from Songhai, sacked Gao. In 1737, the Tuareg massacred the Arma. The Fulani were migratory people. They moved from Mauritania and settled in Feuda Toro, Feuda Jalan, and subsequently throughout the rest of West Africa. By the 14th century CE, they had converted to Islam. During the 16th century, they established themselves at Messina in southern Mali. During the 1670s, they declared jihads on non-Muslims. Several states were formed from these jihadist wars, at Feuda Toro, Feuda Jalan, Messina, Walia, and Bundu. The most important of these states was the Sokoto Caliphate or Fulani Empire. In the city of Gobir, Usman Dan Fodio accused the Hausa leadership of practicing an impure version of Islam and of being morally corrupt. In 1804, he launched the Fulani War as a jihad among a population that was restless about high taxes and discontented with its leaders. Jihad fever swept northern Nigeria, with strong support among both the Fulani and the Hausa. Usman created an empire that included parts of northern Nigeria, Benin, and Cameroon, with Sokoto as its capital. He retired to teach and write and handed the empire to his son Muhammad Bello. The Sokoto Caliphate lasted until 1903 when the British conquered northern Nigeria. The Akan speak a Kwa language. The speakers of Kwa languages are believed to have come from East-Central Africa, before settling in the Sahel. By the 12th century, the Akan Kingdom of Bonaman was established. During the 13th century, when the gold mines in modern-day Mali started to dry up, 
Bonneman and later other Akin states began to rise to prominence as the major players in the gold trade. It was Bonneman and other Akin kingdoms like Denkiira, Akyem, Akwamo which were the predecessors to what became the all-powerful empire of Ashanti. When and how the Ashanti got to their present location is debatable. What is known is that by the 17th century an Akan people were identified as living in a state called Kwaman. The location of the state was north of Lake Buzam Tui. The state's revenue was mainly derived from trading in gold and kola nuts and clearing forest to plant yams. They built towns between the Pra and Oven rivers. They formed alliances for defense and paid tribute to Denki Ira, one of the more powerful Akan states at that time, along with Adansai and Akwamu. During the 16th century, Ashanti society experienced sudden changes, including population growth because of cultivation of New World plants such as cassava and maize, and an increase in the gold trade between the coast and the north. By the 17th century, Osei Kofi Tutuai, with help of Okumfo Anaki, unified what became the Ashanti into a confederation with the Golden Stool as a symbol of their unity and spirit. Osei Tutu engaged in a massive territorial expansion. He built up the Ashanti army based on the Akan state of Akwamu introducing new organization and turning a disciplined militia into an effective fighting machine. In 1701, the Ashanti conquered Denkiira, giving them access to the coastal trade with Europeans, especially the Dutch. Apoku where I engaged in further expansion, adding other southern Akan states to the growing empire. He turned north adding Tekiman, Banda, Gyaman, and Ganja, states on the Black Volta. Between 1744 and 1745, Asante Hene Apoku attacked the powerful northern state of Dagamba, gaining control of the important Middle Niger trade routes. Kuzi Abadam succeeded Apoku. He solidified all the newly won territories. Osei Quadwo imposed administrative reforms that allowed the empire to be governed effectively and to continue its military expansion. Osei Kwame Panyan, Osei Tutu Kwame, and Osei Bonsu continued territorial consolidation and expansion. The Ashanti Empire included all of present day Ghana and large parts of the Ivory Coast. The Ashanta Heni inherited his position from his mother. He was assisted at the capital, Kumasi, by a civil service of men talented in trade, diplomacy, and the military, with a head called the Gyaasa Heni. Men from Arabia, Sudan, and Europe were employed in the civil service, all of them appointed by the Ashanta Heni. At the capital and in other towns, the Ankobia or special police were used as bodyguards to the Ashanta Heni, as sources of intelligence, and to suppress rebellion. Communication throughout the empire was maintained via a network of well-kept roads from the coast to the Middle Niger and linking together other trade cities. Uruwi Madagascar and Marina Lake Plateau States and Empires Kidara and Bunyoro Buganda Rwanda Burundi Maravi West Africa II Sahelian Empires and States Ghana Mali Songhai Sokoto Caliphate Forest Empires and States Akan Kingdoms and Emergence of Asante Empire Dahomey Yoruba Benin Niger Delta and Igbo 19th Century Southern Africa II Angunaland
Vura Trekkers. European Trade, Exploration and Conquest. France vs Britain, The Fashoda Crisis of 1898. European Colonial Territories. 20th Century. The World Wars. Post-war Africa, Decolonization. East Africa. North Africa 2. Southern Africa 3. West Africa 3. Historiography of British Africa. Notes. Atlases. Historiography. For most of the 19th century, the Ashanti Empire remained powerful. It was later destroyed in 1900 by British superior weaponry and organization following the four Anglo Ashanti Wars. The Dahomey Kingdom was founded in the early 17th century when the Aya people of the Alida Kingdom moved northward and settled among the FON. They began to assert their power a few years later. In so doing, they established the Kingdom of Dahomey, with its capital at Agbom. King Haugbadja organized Dahomey into a powerful centralized state. He declared all lands to be owned of the king and subject to taxation. Primogeniture in the kingship was established, neutralizing all input from village chiefs. A cult of kingship was established. A captive slave would be sacrificed annually to honor the royal ancestors. During the 1720s, the slave trading states of Wida and Alida were taken, giving Dahomey direct access to the slave coast and trade with Europeans. King Agaja attempted to end the slave trade by keeping the slaves on plantations producing palm oil, but the European profits on slaves and Dahomey's dependency on firearms were too great. In 1730, under King Agaja, Dahomey was conquered by the Oyo Empire, and Dahomey had to pay tribute. Taxes on slaves were mostly paid in Kari shells. During the 19th century, palm oil was the main trading commodity. France conquered Dahomey during the Second Franco-Dahomeyan War and established a colonial government there. Most of the troops who fought against Dahomey were native Africans. Traditionally, the Yoruba people viewed themselves as the inhabitants of a united empire, in contrast to the situation today, in which Yoruba is the cultural linguistic designation for speakers of a language in the Niger-Congo family. The name comes from a Hausa word to refer to the Oyo Empire. The first Yoruba state was Ilefe, said to have been founded around 1000 AD by a supernatural figure, the first Oni Odujuwa. Odujuwa's sons would be the founders of the different city-states of the Yoruba, and his daughters would become the mothers of the various Yoruba Obas, or kings. Yoruba city-states were usually governed by an Oba and an Iwerfa, a council of chiefs who advised the Oba. By the 18th century, the Yoruba city-states formed a loose confederation, with the ONI of Ife as the head and Ife as the capital. As time went on, the individual city-states became more powerful with their Obas assuming more powerful spiritual positions and diluting the authority of the ONI of Ife. Rivalry became intense among the city-states. The Oyo Empire rose in the 16th century. The Oyo state had been conquered in 1550 by the Kingdom of Noop, which was in possession of cavalry, an important tactical advantage. The Elephan of Oyo was sent into exile. After returning, Elephan Orampato built up an army based on heavily armed cavalry and long service troops. This made them invincible in combat on the northern grasslands and in the thinly wooded forests. By the end of the 16th century, 
Oyo had added the western region of the Niger to the hills of Togo, the Yoruba of Ketu, Dahomey, and the FON nation. A governing council served the empire, with clear executive divisions. Each acquired region was assigned a local administrator. Families served in king-making capacities. Oyo, as a northern Yoruba kingdom, served as middleman in the north-south trade and connecting the eastern forest of Guinea with the western and central Sudan, the Sahara, and North Africa. The Yoruba manufactured cloth, ironware, and pottery, which were exchanged for salt, leather, and most importantly horses from the Sudan to maintain the cavalry. Oyo remained strong for 200 years. It became a protectorate of Great Britain in 1888, before further fragmenting into warring factions. The Oyo state ceased to exist as any sort of power in 1896. The Kwa Niger Congo speaking Edo people had established the Benin Empire by the middle of the 15th century. It was engaged in political expansion and consolidation from its very beginning. Under Oba Iyoware, the state was organized for conquest. He solidified central authority and initiated 30 years of war with his neighbors. At his death, the Benin Empire extended to Dahomey in the west, to the Niger Delta in the east, along the West African coast, and to the Yoruba towns in the north. Iyoware's grandson Oba Izaji eroded the power of the Uzuma and increased contact and trade with Europeans especially with the Portuguese who provided a new source of copper for court art. The Oba ruled with the advice of the Uzuma, a council consisting of chiefs of powerful families and town chiefs of different guilds. Later its authority was diminished by the establishment of administrative dignitaries. Women wielded power. The Queen Mother who produced the future Oba wielded immense influence. Benin was never a significant exporter of slaves, as Alan Ryder's book Benin and the Europeans showed. By the early 18th century, it was wrecked with dynastic disputes and civil wars. However, it regained much of its former power in the reigns of Oba Iris Oyan and Oba Akeng Buddha. After the 16th century, Benin mainly exported pepper, ivory, gum, and cotton cloth to the Portuguese and Dutch who resold it to other African societies on the coast. In 1897, the British sacked the city. The Niger Delta comprised numerous city-states with numerous forms of government. These city-states were protected by the waterways and thick vegetation of the Delta. The region was transformed by trade in the 17th century. The Delta city-states were comparable to those of the Swahili people in East Africa. Some, like Bani, Kalabari, and Wari, had kings. Others, like Brass, were republics with small senates, and those at Cross River and Old Calabar were ruled by merchants of the Ekp society. The Ekp society regulated trade and made rules for members known as house systems. Some of these houses, like the Pebbles of Bonnie, were well known in the Americas and Europe. The Igbo lived east of the Delta. The Kingdom of Nri rose in the 9th century, with the Ease Nri being its leader. It was a political entity composed of villages and each village was autonomous and independent with its own territory and name, each recognized by its neighbors. Villages were democratic with all males and sometimes females a part of the decision-making process. Graves at Igboyukwu contained brass artifacts of local manufacture and glass beads from Egypt or India, indicative of extra-regional trade. By the 1850s, British and German missionaries and traders had penetrated present-day Namibia. 
Herrero and Nama competed for guns and ammunition, providing cattle, ivory, and ostrich feathers. The Germans were more firmly established than the British in the region. By 1884, the Germans declared the coastal region from the Orange River to the Kunana River a German protectorate, part of German Southwest Africa. They pursued an aggressive policy of land expansion for white settlements. They exploited rivalry between the Nama and Herero. The Herero entered into an alliance with the Germans, thinking they could get an upper hand on the Nama. The Germans set up a garrison at the Herero capital and started allocating Herero land for white settlements, including the best grazing land in the central plateau and made tax and labor demands. The Herero and Ovambandari rebelled, but the rebellion was crushed and leaders were executed. Between 1896 and 1897, Rinderpest crippled the economic backbone of the Herero and Nama economy and slowed white expansion. The Germans continued the policy of making Namibia a white settlement by seizing land and cattle, and even trying to export Herero labor to South Africa. In 1904, the Herero rebelled. German General Lothar von Trothe implemented an extermination policy at the Battle of Waterberg, which drove the Herero west of the Kalahari Desert. At the end of 1905, only 16,000 Herero were alive, out of a previous population of 80,000. Nama resistance was crushed in 1907. All Nama and Herero cattle and land were confiscated from the very diminished population, with remaining Nama and Herero assuming a subordinate position. Labor had to be imported from among the Ovambo. A moment of great disorder in southern Africa was the Mfakane, the crushing. It was started by the northern Nguni kingdoms of Mthethwa, Ndwandwi, and Swaziland over scarce resource and famine. When Dingiswayo of Mthethwa died, Shaka of the Zulu people took over. He established the Zulu kingdom, asserting authority over the Ndwandwi and pushing the Swazi north. The scattering and Wandwi and Swaza caused the Mfakane to spread. During the 1820s, Shaka expanded the empire all along the Drakensberg foothills, with tribute being paid as far south as the Tugela and Umzimkolo rivers. He replaced the chiefs of conquered polities with Indunas, responsible to him. He introduced a centralized, dedicated, and disciplined military force not seen in the region, with a new weapon in the short stabbing spear. In 1828, Shaka was assassinated by his half-brother Dingani, who lacked the military genius and leadership skills of Shaka. Vurtrekkers tried to occupy Zulu land in 1838. In the early months they were defeated, but the survivors regrouped at the Ngum River and soundly defeated the Zulu. However, the Vur trekkers dared not settle Zulu land. Dingana was killed in 1840 during a civil war. His brother Mban took over and strengthened Zulu territories to the north. In 1879 the Zulu Kingdom was invaded by Britain in a quest to control all of South Africa. The Zulu Kingdom was victorious at the Battle of Isandvawana but was defeated at the Battle of Ulundi. One of the major states to emerge from the Mfakane was the Sotho Kingdom founded at the Bobosia by Ma Shushuai around 1821 to 1822. It was a confederation of different polities that accepted the absolute authority of Ma Shushu. During the 1830s, the kingdom invited missionaries as a strategic means of acquiring guns and horses from the Cape. The Orange Free State slowly diminished the kingdom but never completely defeated it. In 1868, 
Ma Shushu asked that the Sotho kingdom be annexed by Britain, to save the remnant. It became the British protectorate of Basutoland. By the 19th century, most Khoikhoi territory was under Boer control. The Khoikhoi had lost economic and political independence and had been absorbed into Boer society. The Boers spoke Afrikaans, a language or dialect derived from Dutch, and no longer called themselves Boers but Afrikaners. Some Khoikhoi were used as commandos in raids against other Khoikhoi and later Kosa. A mixed Khoi, slave, and European population called the Cape Collards, who were outcasts within colonial society, also arose. Khoikhoi who lived far on the frontier included the Kora, Oralams, and Graikwa. In 1795, the British took over the Cape Colony from the Dutch. In the 1830s, Boers embarked on a journey of expansion, east of the Great Fish River into the Zeeuwervold. They were referred to as Voertrekkers. They founded republics of the Transvaal and Orange Free State, mostly in areas of sparse population that had been diminished by the Mfakane slash Difakan. Unlike the Khoisan, the Bantu states were not conquered by the Afrikaners, because of population density and greater unity. Additionally, they began to arm themselves with guns acquired through trade at the Cape. In some cases, as in the Kosa slash Boer Wars, Boers were removed from Kosa lands. It required a dedicated imperial military force to subdue the Bantu speaking states. In 1901, the Boer republics were defeated by Britain in the Second Boer War. The defeat, however, consummated many Afrikaners' ambition South Africa would be under white rule. The British placed all power legislative, executive, administrative and English and Afrikaner hands. Between 1878 and 1898, European states partitioned and conquered most of Africa. For 400 years, European nations had mainly limited their involvement to trading stations on the African coast. Few dared venture inland from the coast, those that did, like the Portuguese, often met defeats and had to retreat to the coast. Several technological innovations helped to overcome this 400-year pattern. One was the development of repeating rifles, which were easier and quicker to load than muskets. Artillery was being used increasingly. In 1885, Hiram S. Maxim developed the Maxim gun, the model of the modern-day machine gun. European states kept these weapons largely among themselves by refusing to sell these weapons to African leaders. African germs took numerous European lives and deterred permanent settlements. Diseases such as yellow fever, sleeping sickness, yaws, and leprosy made Africa a very inhospitable place for Europeans. The deadliest disease was malaria, endemic throughout tropical Africa. In 1854, the discovery of quinine and other medical innovations helped to make conquest and colonization in Africa possible. Strong motives for conquest of Africa were at play. Raw materials were needed for European factories. Europe in the early part of the 19th century was undergoing its industrial revolution. Nationalist rivalries and prestige were at play. Acquiring African colonies would show rivals that a nation was powerful and significant. These factors culminated in the scramble for Africa. Knowledge of Africa increased. Numerous European explorers began to explore the continent. Mungo Park traversed the Niger River. James Bruce traveled through Ethiopia and located the source of the Blue Nile. Richard Francis Burton was the first European at Lake Tanganyika. 
Samuel White Baker explored the Upper Nile. John Hanning Speck located a source of the Nile at Lake Victoria. Other significant European explorers included Heinrich Barth, Henry Morton Stanley, Silva Porto, Alexander de Serp of Pinto, René Kael, Friedrich Gerhard Rolfs, Gustav Nachtigal, George Schweinfurth, and Joseph Thomson. The most famous of the explorers was David Livingstone, who explored southern Africa and traversed the continent from the Atlantic at Luanda to the Indian Ocean at Clamaine. European explorers made use of African guides and servants, and established long-distance trading routes were used. Missionaries attempting to spread Christianity also increased European knowledge of Africa. Between 1884 and 1885, European nations met at the Berlin-West Africa Conference to discuss the partitioning of Africa. It was agreed that European claims to parts of Africa would only be recognized if Europeans provided effective occupation. In a series of treaties in 1890-1891, colonial boundaries were completely drawn. All of Sub-Saharan Africa was claimed by European powers, except for Ethiopia and Liberia. The European powers set up a variety of different administrations in Africa, reflecting different ambitions and degrees of power. In some areas, such as parts of British West Africa, colonial control was tenuous and intended for simple economic extraction, strategic power, or as part of a long-term development plan. In other areas, Europeans were encouraged to settle, creating settler states in which a European minority dominated. Settlers only came to a few colonies in sufficient numbers to have a strong impact. British settler colonies included British East Africa, Northern and Southern Rhodesia, and South Africa, which already had a significant population of European settlers, the Boers. France planned to settle Algeria and eventually incorporated into the French state on an equal basis with the European provinces. Algeria's proximity across the Mediterranean allowed plans of this scale. In most areas colonial administrations did not have the manpower or resources to fully administer the territory and had to rely on local power structures to help them. Various factions and groups within the societies exploited this European requirement for their own purposes, attempting to gain positions of power within their own communities by cooperating with Europeans. One aspect of this struggle included what Terence Ranger has termed the invention of tradition. In order to legitimize their own claims to power in the eyes of both the colonial administrators and their own people, native elites would essentially manufacture traditional claims to power, or ceremonies. As a result, many societies were thrown into disarray by the new order. Following the scramble for Africa, an early but secondary focus for most colonial regimes was the suppression of slavery and the slave trade. By the end of the colonial period they were mostly successful in this aim, though slavery is still very active in Africa. As a part of the scramble for Africa, France had the establishment of a continuous west-east axis of the continent as an objective, in contrast with the British North-South axis. Tensions between Britain and France reached tinder stage in Africa. At several points war was possible, but never happened. The most serious episode was the Fashoda incident of 1898. French troops tried to claim an area in the southern Sudan, and a much more powerful British force purporting to be acting in the interests of the Khedive of Egypt arrived to confront them. Under heavy pressure the French withdrew securing British control over the area. The status quo was recognized by an agreement between the two states acknowledging British control over Egypt, 
while France became the dominant power in Morocco, but France suffered a humiliating defeat overall. Belgium France Germany Italy Portugal Spain United Kingdom Independent States In the 1880s the European powers had divided up almost all of Africa. They ruled until after World War II when forces of nationalism grew much stronger. In the 1950s and 1960s the colonial holdings became independent states. The process was usually peaceful but there were several long bitter bloody civil wars, as in Algeria, Kenya, and elsewhere. Across Africa the powerful new force of nationalism drew upon the organizational skills that natives learned in the British and French and other armies in the world wars. It led to organizations that were not controlled by or endorsed by either the colonial powers not the traditional local power structures that were collaborating with the colonial powers. Nationalistic organizations began to challenge both the traditional and the new colonial structures and finally displaced them. Leaders of nationalist movements took control when the European authorities exited, many ruled for decades or until they died off. These structures included political, educational, religious, and other social organizations. In recent decades, Many African countries have undergone the triumph and defeat of nationalistic fervor, changing in the process the loci of the centralizing state power and patrimonial state. With the vast majority of the continent under the colonial control of European governments, the world wars were significant events in the geopolitical history of Africa. Africa was a theater of war and saw fighting in both wars. More important in most regions, the total war footing of colonial powers impacted the governance of African colonies, through resource allocation, conscription, and taxation. In World War I there were several campaigns in Africa, including the Togoland Campaign, the Cameroon Campaign, the South West Africa Campaign, and the East African Campaign. In each, Allied forces, primarily British, but also French, Belgian, South African, and Portuguese, sought to force the Germans out of their African colonies. In each, German forces were badly outnumbered and, due to Allied naval superiority, were cut off from reinforcement or resupply. The Allies eventually conquered all German colonies. German forces in East Africa managed to avoid surrender throughout the war, though they could not hold any territory after 1917. After World War I, former German colonies in Africa were taken over by France, Belgium, and the British Empire. After World War I, colonial powers continued to consolidate their control over their African territories. In some areas, particularly in southern and East Africa, large settler populations were successful in pressing for additional devolution of administration, so-called home rule by the white settlers. In many cases, settler regimes were harsher on African populations, tending to see them more as a threat to political power as opposed to colonial regimes which had generally endeavored to co-opt local populations into economic production. The Great Depression strongly affected Africa's non-subsistence economy, much of which was based on commodity production for Western markets. As demand increased in the late 1930s, Africa's economy rebounded as well. Africa was the site of one of the first instances of fascist territorial expansions in the 1930s. Italy had attempted to conquer Ethiopia in the 1890s but had been rebuffed in the First Italo-Ethiopian War. 
Ethiopia lay between two Italian colonies, Italian Somaliland and Eritrea and was invaded in October 1935. With an overwhelming advantage in armor and aircraft, by May 1936, Italian forces had occupied the capital of Addis Ababa and effectively declared victory. Ethiopia and their other colonies were consolidated into Italian East Africa. Since Germany had lost its African colonies following World War I, World War II did not reach Africa until Italy joined the war on June 10, 1940, controlling Libya and Italian East Africa. With the fall of France on June 25, most of France's colonies in North and West Africa were controlled by the Vichy government, though much of Central Africa fell under Free French control after some fighting between Vichy and Free French forces at the Battle of Dakar and the Battle of Gabon. After the fall of France, Africa was the only active theater for ground combat until the Italian invasion of Greece in October. In the Western Desert Campaign Italian forces from Libya sought to overrun Egypt, controlled by the British. Simultaneously, in the East African Campaign, Italian East African forces overrun British Somaliland and some British outposts in Kenya and Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. When Italy's efforts to conquer Egypt and Sudan fell short, they were unable to re-establish supply to Italian East Africa. Without the ability to reinforce or resupply and surrounded by Allied possessions, Italian East Africa was conquered by mainly British and South African forces in 1941. In North Africa, the Italians soon requested help from the Germans who sent a substantial force under General Rommel. With German help, the Axis forces regained the upper hand but were unable to break through British defences in two tries at El Alamein. In late 1942, Allied forces, mainly Americans and Canadians, invaded French North Africa in Operation Torch, where Vichy French forces initially surprised them with their resistance but were convinced to stop fighting after three days. The Second Front relieved pressure on the British in Egypt who began pushing west to meet up with the Torch forces, eventually pinning German and Italian forces in Tunisia, which was conquered by May 1943 in the Tunisia Campaign, ending the war in Africa. The only other significant operations occurred in the French colony of Madagascar which was invaded by the British in May 1942 to deny its ports to the Axis. The French garrisons in Madagascar surrendered in November 1942. The decolonization of Africa started with Libya in 1951, although Liberia, South Africa, Egypt and Ethiopia were already independent. Many countries followed in the 1950s and 1960s, with a peak in 1960 with the Year of Africa, which saw 17 African nations declare independence, including a large part of French West Africa. Most of the remaining countries gained independence throughout the 1960s, although some colonizers were reluctant to relinquish sovereignty resulting in bitter wars of independence which lasted for a decade or more. The last African countries to gain formal independence were Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique and Angola from Portugal, Djibouti from France in 1977, Zimbabwe from the United Kingdom in 1980, and Namibia from South Africa in 1990. Eritrea later split off from Ethiopia in 1993. The Mau Mau uprising took place in Kenya from 1952 until 1956 but was put down by British and local forces. A state of emergency remained in place until 1960. Kenya became independent in 1963, and Yomo Kenyatta served as its first president.
The early 1960s also signaled the start of major clashes between the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda and Burundi. In 1994 this culminated in the Rwandan Genocide, a conflict in which over 800,000 people were murdered. Moroccan nationalism developed during the 1930s, the Istiklal party was formed, pushing for independence. In 1953 Sultan Mohammed V of Morocco called for independence. On March 2, 1956, Morocco became independent of France. Mohammed V became ruler of independent Morocco. In 1954, Algeria formed the National Liberation Front as it split from France. This resulted in the Algerian War which lasted until independence negotiations in 1962. Mohamed Ahmed Ben Bella was elected president of Algeria. Over a million French nationals, predominantly Pied Noirs, left the country, crippling the economy. In 1934, the Neodister party was founded by Habib Bourguiba pushing for independence in Tunisia. Tunisia became independent in 1955. Its bay was deposed and Habib Bourguiba elected as president of Tunisia. In 1954, Gamal Abdel Nasser deposed the monarchy of Egypt in the Egyptian Revolution of 1952 and came to power as Prime Minister of Egypt. Muammar Gaddafi led the 1969 Libyan coup d'etat which deposed Idris of Libya. Gaddafi remained in power until his death in the Libyan Civil War of 2011. Egypt was involved in several wars against Israel and was allied with other Arab countries. The first was the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, right after the State of Israel was founded. Egypt went to war again in the Six-Day War of 1967 and lost the Sinai Peninsula to Israel. They went to war yet again in the Yom Kippur War of 1973. In 1979, President of Egypt Anwar Sadat and Prime Minister of Israel Menachem Begin signed the Camp David Accords, which gave back the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt in exchange for the recognition of Israel. The Accords are still in effect today. In 1981, Sadat was assassinated by members of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad under Khalid Islam Bully. The assassins were Islamists who targeted Sadat for his signing of the Accords. In 1948 the apartheid laws were started in South Africa by the dominant National Party. These were largely a continuation of existing policies, the difference was the policy of separate development. Where previous policies had only been disparate efforts to economically exploit the African majority, apartheid represented an entire philosophy of separate racial goals, leading to both the divisive laws of petty apartheid, and the grander scheme of African homelands. In 1994, the South African government abolished apartheid. South Africans elected Nelson Mandela of the African National Congress in the South African general election, 1994, the country's first multiracial presidential election. Following World War II, nationalist movements arose across West Africa, most notably in Ghana under Kwame Nkrumah. In 1957, Ghana became the first sub-Saharan colony to achieve its independence, followed the next year by France's colonies. By 1974, West Africa's nations were entirely autonomous. Since independence, many West African nations have been plagued by corruption and instability, with notable civil wars in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Ivory Coast and a succession of military coups in Ghana and Burkina Faso. Many states have failed to develop their economies despite enviable natural resources, 
and political instability is often accompanied by undemocratic government. See also 2014 Ebola virus epidemic in Sierra Leone, 2014 Ebola virus epidemic in Guinea, and 2014 Ebola virus epidemic in Liberia. The first historical studies in English appeared in the 1890s, and followed one of four approaches. One the territorial narrative was typically written by a veteran soldier or civil servant who gave heavy emphasis to what he had seen. Two the apologia were essays designed to justify British policies. Three popularizers tried to reach a large audience. Four compendia appeared designed to combine academic and official credentials. Professional scholarship appeared around 1900, and began with the study of business operations, typically using government documents and unpublished archives. The economic approach was widely practiced in the 1930s, primarily to provide descriptions of the changes underway in the previous half-century. In 1935, American historian William L. Langer published The Diplomacy of Imperialism, 1890-1902, a book that is still widely cited. In 1939, Oxford professor Reginald Copeland published The Exploitation of East Africa, 1856-1890, The Slave Trade and the Scramble, another popular treatment. World War II diverted most scholars to wartime projects and accounted for a pause in scholarship during the 1940s. By the 1950s many African students were studying in British universities, and they produced a demand for new scholarship, and started themselves to supply it as well. Oxford University became the main centre for African studies with activity as well at Cambridge University and the London School of Economics. The perspective of British government policymakers or international business operations slowly gave way to a new interest in the activities of the natives, especially nationalistic movements and the growing demand for independence. The major breakthrough came from Ronald Robinson and John Andrew Gallagher especially with their studies of the impact of free trade on Africa. In 1985 the Oxford History of South Africa was published, attempting to synthesize the available materials. In 2013, the Oxford Handbook of Modern African History was published, bringing the scholarship up to date.